Stage 6. Subduing Subtle Distractions 6. The goal of Stage 6 is to subdue subtle distractions and develop metacognitive introspective awareness. Set and hold the intention to establish a clearly defined scope of attention and completely ignore subtle distractions. These intentions will mature into the highly developed skills of stable attention and mindfulness, and you will achieve both exclusive, single-pointed attention and metacognitive introspective awareness. Practice Goals for Stage 6 you begin this stage with a more energized mind, so objects of attention are clear and vivid. Peripheral awareness is also brighter and more open. Just as turning up the light in a dark room illuminates objects in the shadows, your heightened conscious power reveals thoughts and sensations previously too subtle to detect. It may even seem like there are more subtle distractions than before— but you've just become more aware of the ones that were already present and scattering your attention. Your primary goal for this stage is to subdue subtle distractions, particularly those produced by the discriminating mind. The first step is to achieve exclusive attention, also called single-pointed attention. When you can focus exclusively on the meditation object despite competing stimuli, Attention no longer alternates to subtle distractions. Next, you must sustain exclusive attention long enough that mental objects start to fade from awareness. Then you'll have subdued subtle distractions. Make no mistake, while exclusive attention is a valuable skill, it's only a means to subduing subtle distractions, not an end in itself. Also, subtle distractions are only temporarily subdued. They will return if you stop exerting effort to ignore them. You won't overcome distractions completely until stage seven. Your second goal, which you'll work on at the same time, is to develop metacognitive introspective awareness, an awareness of the mind itself. You accomplish this by holding a clear intention to continuously observe the state and activities of your mind while still maintaining exclusive attention. You have mastered stage six when attention rarely alternates with bodily sensations and ambient sounds. Thoughts are at most infrequent and fleeting, and metacognitive awareness is continuous. When you can sustain exclusive attention together with powerful mindfulness for long periods, you have reached the second major milestone and are a skilled meditator. Developing and Sustaining Exclusive Attention to Subdue Subtle Distractions Developing exclusive focus means ignoring subtle distractions. Subtle distractions are like children who keep trying to get the attention of a parent occupied with an important activity. If you ignore them consistently enough, they get tired of trying and don't interrupt as often. Yet if you stop ignoring them, even for a moment, they'll be back clamoring for attention again. In the same way, you subdue subtle distractions by not giving them the energy of your attention. The Energy of Attention Whenever you give a thought any attention, even subtly, that gives it energy to continue and potentially stir up related thoughts. If you ignore the thought and focus on something else, it fades and disappears. The next time you meditate, make a point of observing this for yourself. The quality of exclusive focus depends as much on stabilizing the scope of attention as it does on fixating on an object. Otherwise, even if your attention remains fixed, your scope will spontaneously expand to include other things, especially thoughts. Therefore, you must first clearly define and stabilize your scope of attention. Then you completely ignore everything outside that scope. At the same time, remember to exclude nothing from peripheral awareness. Both awareness and attention are working together in developing exclusive attention. Awareness keeps a watchful lookout for potential distractions. When detected, attention responds by tightening up the focus and ignoring the potential distraction. 
consistently sustained exclusive attention leads to a dramatic decrease in the number and frequency of mental objects projected into consciousness by the thinking, emotional mind. Eventually they fade from consciousness so completely that they rarely appear even in peripheral awareness, meaning subtle distractions have been subdued. This process, called pacifying the mind, begins in this stage and continues through stage seven. Conscious Intention Conscious intention is the key to developing exclusive attention. Simply hold the intention to observe all the fine details of the meditation object. At the same time, hold the intention to ignore everything else. That's it. Of course, many conflicting intentions lie beneath the surface that complicate such a simple formula. Therefore, let's examine the whole process more closely. As you know, the presence of a subtle distraction means attention is rapidly alternating between the breath and the distraction. These spontaneous movements of attention occur because unconscious sub-minds keep projecting different objects into consciousness, each with an intention to become an object of attention. Say you're focusing on the breath when a new object suddenly appears in peripheral awareness. Maybe it's a feeling of annoyance at the sound of a barking dog. That sound arrives with a strong intention for it to become your new object of attention, as does the annoyance it elicits. These new intentions conflict with your current intention to follow the breath. What you're actually experiencing is a series of moments of attention, some with the breath as their object, others with the feeling of annoyance. Each moment arrives with an intention for its object to become the object of future moments of attention. Whichever object is associated with the stronger intention receives more attention, and so long as it's the breath, your attention seems stable while the reaction to the noise just stands out as a subtle distraction. But depending on which of the two intentions subsequently receives more support and energy from the mind system as a whole, either could end up receiving most or all of your attention. Any time you intentionally choose to focus your attention more firmly on the breath and ignore a distraction, you shift this balance. Remember, any action arising from conscious intention results from an agreement among several sub-minds rather than the intention of just one, so it's always stronger and more effective. Fewer moments of attention go to the distraction, so the distraction and the intention behind it fade away. Mind Models, Intention, and Exclusive Attention In terms of the moments of consciousness model, the intention to have exclusive attention increases the number of perceiving moments focused on the meditation object until they are as many as possible. It also decreases the number of perceiving moments focused on distractions until there are as few as possible. In terms of the mind-system model, the practice of exclusive attention is an exercise of executive function that gradually trains your unconscious sub-minds to stop projecting distractions into consciousness. To summarize, Individual sub-minds in the unconscious project potential distractions into peripheral awareness. Each of these potential distractions arrives with the intention to become a new object of attention. These unconscious, bottom-up intentions come into conflict with our conscious, top-down intention to observe the meditation object. How the conflict goes depends on which intention is stronger. That's why it's so important to hold the intention to observe the breath in ever greater detail, and to ignore distractions completely, while at the same time making sure to sustain peripheral awareness. These intentions create an even stronger consensus of sub-minds, making attention more stable. Put another way, the more fully conscious our intentions, the more completely the conflict will be resolved in favor of focusing on the breath. Experiencing the Whole Body with the Breath, a method for developing exclusive attention. It's possible to achieve exclusive attention by just focusing over and over on the breath at the nose and ignoring subtle distractions until they fade away. But that can take a very long time. 
Experiencing the whole body with the breath is a faster and more enjoyable method that makes it much easier to complete the ignore distractions. This practice involves clearly defining, then gradually expanding, the scope of your intention until it includes sensations related to the breath throughout the entire body all at once. The method itself builds on the body scanning practice you learned in Stage 5. Just as with the body scan, you first direct your attention to the breath at the abdomen, then, making sure that peripheral awareness of the breath at the abdomen doesn't fade, you shift your attention to a particular body part, such as your hand. Define your scope of attention to include that area only. Then further refine your scope to include only the breath sensations in the hand. Ignore all other sensations by excluding them completely from attention, but let them remain in peripheral awareness. Next, move to another body part, perhaps the forearm, and do the same thing. Each moment of attention should include a very strong intention to focus clearly on breath-related sensations and to exclude everything else. As your skill improves, keep increasing the scope of your attention to include larger and larger areas. Also, keep shifting between larger and smaller areas. For example, you might move between one finger and the entire arm. Your intention should be to observe all breath-related sensations as clearly in the whole arm as in that one finger. Whether you succeed or not isn't important, though eventually you will succeed. What matters is that simply holding this intention will bring your maximum available conscious capacity to bear on the current task. The differences between this practice and everything you've done before are small but crucial. First, you define your scope of attention much more precisely. Second, you focus exclusively on breath-related sensations. You used to tolerate the presence of subtle distractions, letting them come, letting them be, and letting them go. In fact, you were warned not to try to keep attention from alternating with these objects. Now, it's just the opposite. You aim to ignore thoughts and non-breath-related sensations so completely that attention never alternates with them. They remain only in peripheral awareness. Finally, you will keep expanding your scope of attention until it includes the entire body. In the words of the Buddha, experience the whole body with the breath. Experiencing the whole body while breathing in, he trains himself. Experiencing the whole body while breathing out, he trains himself. Anapanasati Sutta when you can clearly observe all the breath sensations occurring in the body at once, you are so fully engaged that there's no attention to spare for distractions. As long as you ignore everything but the expanded meditation object, subtle distractions are temporarily subdued. Your sensory sub-minds keep projecting non-breath-related sensations into consciousness, but they appear only in peripheral awareness. However, mental objects are much less evident, even in awareness. Your discriminating sub-minds may keep knocking on the door of consciousness with their various thoughts, but they can't get a word in edgewise. After a while, they just quit trying. Yet they do keep generating thoughts at an unconscious level, which is why distractions can still arise if you don't stay vigilant. After a while, shift your focus back to the breath of the nose. You may find it easier to make the transition by adding a middle step, shifting your attention first to the abdomen. However, once you've returned to the nose, you'll experience a period of exclusive attention to this much smaller object. Very few mental objects will even make it into peripheral awareness. When exclusive focus starts to fade, repeat the entire exercise of experiencing the whole body with the breath. There's no reason to go part by part through the entire body each time unless it's helpful. Once you've learned to recognize breath-related sensations everywhere, you can return immediately to the whole body, or first to the abdomen, then to the whole body. With practice, you'll be able to sustain exclusive focus on the breath at the nose for longer and longer.
Such stable attention characterizes the concentration of an adept meditator. So how does this practice work? When we sit somewhere quiet and close our eyes to meditate, sights, sounds, smells, and tastes are reduced to a minimum. However, lots of bodily sensations and thoughts are still projected into consciousness by unconscious sub-minds. These two kinds of objects dominate peripheral awareness and are the major source of subtle distractions, competing with the breath and each other for your attention. Mental objects produced by the discriminating mind are the more intrusive of these two types of distractions, so it makes sense to deal with them first. You do that in this practice by emphasizing bodily sensations. Specifically, this practice helps develop exclusive attention because it takes advantage of the way bodily sensations compete with mental objects for attention. When we expand our scope of attention to include the entire body, that's a huge amount of somatosensory information to take in. With all those bodily sensations filling consciousness, there's simply no attention left over for distracting mental objects. In other words, you create exclusive, single-pointed attention by not shrinking your attention down to a small point, but by expanding it so there's no room for distracting thoughts and other mental objects. Also, by intentionally focusing exclusively on breath-related sensations, you keep other kinds of sensations, including non-breath-related bodily sensations, from becoming subtle distractions. At the same time, the mind grows accustomed to sustaining an exclusive focus of attention. Pacifying the Mind As you develop exclusive attention and can sustain it for longer and longer periods of time, you begin to pacify the mind. Two interrelated processes are involved in this pacification process. First, intentionally ignoring mental objects trains the mind system as a whole to ignore them automatically whenever they appear in consciousness. Second, when they've been consistently ignored, and for long enough, the thinking, emotional mind no longer presents these potential distractions as continuously or vigorously. Thought processes do continue at an unconscious level, but when they consistently fail to become objects of attention, even as subtle distractions, they eventually stop appearing in consciousness altogether. The thinking, emotional mind simply stops projecting its content into consciousness. At this stage, you need constant vigilance and effort to keep the mind pacified. This is because the thinking, emotional sub-minds are continuously active at an unconscious level, even in deep sleep. Therefore, as soon as the intention to focus exclusively on the meditation object weakens, distractions return. The pacification process reaches completion in the course of stage seven. Then you will be one giant step closer to unification of mind. A change in perception of the meditation object. As the mind grows pacified, thoughts and other conceptual objects generated by the discriminating mind start to disappear from consciousness. So does the conceptual veneer that overlays everything we perceive. Conscious experience becomes progressively more non-conceptual and non-discursive. For the first time, we experience the breath more directly as a series of sense percepts arising and passing away. When we start meditating, our experience of the breath is mostly conceptual, although we don't know it at the time. In fact, during the early stages, we are hardly aware of the actual breath sensations just enough to trigger the arising of concepts related to the breath. These concepts, inhaling, pause, exhaling, are our real objects of attention. The conceptualizing begins as we breathe in, when air first strikes the skin at the nostrils. The somatosensory mind projects a small number of mind moments into consciousness that have these breath-related sense percepts as their objects, the discriminating mind immediately assimilates those sense percepts and interprets them using concepts it already has, like nose, touch, air, beginning, and in-breath. When this purely conceptual view of what's happening is projected into consciousness, 
we subjectively perceive the beginning of the in-breath, hardly noticing the actual sensations. The same thing happens again when a few more moments of attention provide another sample of sense percepts produced by air flowing over the skin of the nostrils. The discriminating mind generates another conceptual construct, such as the first part of the middle of the in-breath. In other words, as we engaged with the breath, we were following concepts more than actual sensations. The very idea of the breath is really a complex concept built from many other concepts, that we are a separate being, that we have a body, that we have a nose that's part of our body. Our body is surrounded by air. Air moves through the nose in two directions, and so on. It's not until we start observing the subtle details, the sensations that repeat themselves with every in and out breath, that we actually begin experiencing sense percepts directly. What is true of the breath is also true throughout our lives. Our everyday experience isn't one of sensations so much as of mental constructs built on top of those sensations. The simplest mental constructs are the sense percepts themselves. These, in turn, are used to build increasingly complex conceptual formations. This process has been unfolding since you were born. Your mind has accumulated a huge mass of increasingly elaborate conceptual formations in an attempt to organize and simplify the enormous variety of sensory experiences you've been exposed to. Like in the movie The Matrix, we inhabit a virtual reality built from concepts and ideas, except that, as far as we know, we're not all plugged into a central computer. To put it bluntly, not only don't we experience the world directly, but the reality we live in is a massive collection of conceptual constructs that takes a unique form in each of our minds. Let's return to our experience of the breath. The conceptual experience just described is traditionally called the initial appearance of the meditation object. It's only slightly more refined than a non-meditator's perception of the breath. But for the first time, as we start pacifying the thinking, emotional mind, we can experience the breath purely as a sensory phenomenon, relatively free of conceptualizations, and move past the initial appearance. Your meditation object has finally become the sensations of the breath. You experience a repeated series of sensations arising and passing away, always within a clearly defined scope of attention. First, one sequence of sensations arises and passes away, followed by a brief interval of faint or no sensations. Then a second, different sequence arises and passes away, followed by another brief interval. Then the first series begins again, and on it goes. Since concepts no longer obscure the sensations, you can focus your full conscious power on them, observing with great clarity. This transformation in your experience of the meditation object is significant enough that tradition gives it a label, the acquired appearance of the meditation object, so-called because it is acquired through diligent practice. As we become better at single-pointedly observing the acquired appearance, increasingly subtle bits of conceptual processing become evident through their absence as they drop away. For example, at some point you may suddenly realize you no longer know whether the sensations you're currently observing correspond to the in or the out breath. You also realize that you could know in an instant, but would have to intentionally shift attention away from the sensations to the conceptual formations of the mind. Other times you may suddenly realize that the place where the sensations seem to occur no longer corresponds to where your nose is. The breath seems way off to the side, or above or below where it should be. Normally, breath sensations and our overall awareness of the body are fused together in binding moments of consciousness. Now, breath and body are perceived separately, breath sensations in attention, and body shape and position in peripheral awareness. To recombine them, you would just need to momentarily shift your attention to the shape and position of your body. The result of experiences like these is profound insight into the relationships between attention and awareness, 
sensory experience, and conceptual thinking, and the role of binding moments. Still, such insight can't happen unless you have completely overcome subtle dullness and cultivated mindfulness with powerful introspective awareness. By practicing experiencing the whole body with the breath, you pacify the mind, leading to the acquired appearance of the meditation object. Together, exclusive focus and non-conceptual perception give you the kind of direct experience of the mind that the models we discuss are based on. Cultivating Metacognitive Introspective Awareness Your first goal is to bring attention to a whole new level by subduing subtle distractions while maintaining introspective awareness. The second is to refine this awareness until it becomes metacognitive introspective awareness. We call it metacognitive because that implies a broader view from a higher perspective. It's like taking in a panorama from a hilltop versus being lower down and seeing only the few things immediately surrounding you. From this higher perspective, the object of consciousness is the mind itself. Specifically, Metacognitive introspective awareness means being aware of the ongoing activities and current state of the mind. This is different from just being aware of mental objects, such as particular thoughts and memories, which are merely the contents of the mind. To illustrate, imagine that you're meditating and a mental object appears in peripheral awareness. Maybe it's the thought that you need to change the water filter on the tap or perhaps it's a memory of a compliment someone gave you. This is ordinary introspective awareness of mental objects as content. We merely let them be in peripheral awareness and let them go on their own. However, with metacognitive introspective awareness, you're simply aware that the activity of thinking is occurring, that a thought or memory has arisen, and you know the effect the thought or memory has on your state of mind. You notice, for example, that a memory is causing a pleasant state of mind, but you're not particularly concerned with what the memory is about, though if you wanted to know, you could. We can be metacognitively aware of two types of mental activity. First, we can be aware of what attention is doing. This includes where attention is being directed, the sensory category of the particular object, how attention moves, and its vividness and clarity. For example, you know you're primarily attending to a physical sensation, the breath at the nose. However, if there's a subtle distraction, you also know that attention is alternating. Second, you can be aware of moment-by-moment -moment changes in the objects of peripheral awareness. You may be peripherally aware of a variety of different sensations in your body, but you also know that various sounds are moving in and out of awareness. Here's another example of the two types of activity. Let's say you're practicing experiencing the whole body with the breath. Your predefined scope of attention is therefore your whole body. However, you're aware that the sensations in the lower half of your body are currently not as vivid and clear as the upper half. But then you realize that sensations in your lower half are also becoming more distinct. This is metacognitive awareness of the first kind of activity involving attention. Then you notice a thought about this entire process emerging in peripheral awareness. This is metacognitive awareness of the second kind of activity, changes in objects of awareness. Once metacognitive awareness becomes finely attuned to these mental activities, your practice will become much more effective. The second aspect of metacognitive awareness is being cognizant of the state of your mind. This refers to its clarity and alertness, the predominant emotion, hedonic feelings, and the intentions driving your mental activity. In everyday terms, you're aware of being patient or annoyed, alert or dull, focused or distracted, obsessively focused or mindfully aware, equanimous or grasping, and so forth. During meditation, you want to remain continually aware of the perceptual clarity and overall alertness of the mind, taking corrective actions if you're dull or the sensations are indistinct. 
You want to know if your emotional state is joyful, annoyed, impatient, or bored, or whether or not it's changing. Does the moment-by-moment flow of hedonic feelings tend more toward the pleasant or the unpleasant? You also want to stay aware of how strong your intention is to feel all the sensations of the breath. If the intention gets weaker, reaffirm and strengthen it. You cultivate metacognitive introspective awareness by intending to objectively observe the activities and state of the mind. This means that you intend to know, moment by moment, the movements of attention, the quality of perception, and whether your scope is stable or expanding to include distractions. Are thoughts present in peripheral awareness, and if so, are they verbal or nonverbal? Is the mind restless, agitated, or relaxed? Is it joyful, or perhaps impatient? At the beginning of this stage, there will be a lot of variety in these states and activities, giving you many opportunities to cultivate metacognitive awareness. Metacognitive Awareness and the Narrating Mind According to the Mind System Model, metacognitive awareness results from the activities of the narrating mind. The narrating mind takes in, combines, and integrates information projected into consciousness by other sub-minds, then projects that back as a binding moment of consciousness. Each of these binding moments is a descriptive episode, providing an overview of our mental state and a summary of conscious activities during the brief interval that the episode covers. Binding moments that integrate the content of moments of introspective awareness constitute metacognitive awareness of the mind's ongoing state and activities. Cultivating metacognitive introspective awareness means increasing the proportion of these moments of metacognitive awareness scattered among other moments of attention and awareness. Holding a strong intention to be an objective observer of your own mind causes the narrating mind to increase its information-binding activity, thus producing more moments of metacognitive awareness. Consistently ignoring thoughts, introspective attention, and irrelevant sensations, extrospective attention, further increases the proportion of moments of consciousness available for metacognitive introspective awareness. Metacognitive Attention when the metacognitive binding moments of the narrating mind appear in awareness, the output is just information. That information doesn't undergo a lot of conceptual reinterpretation, and no separate, concrete self is inferred. However, the content of these binding moments can also be taken as objects of attention, and because attention always involves the discriminating mind, the result is quite different. The discriminating mind is where our concept of a self gets constructed. The discriminating mind takes the narrative structure and imputes a singular self, or I, who is in charge. That's why, when you have moments of attention, the ego self always makes an appearance. Despite the higher, more objective perspective of metacognitive introspective attention, the sense of being a self still arises. It feels like there is someone or something that is the witness to what is happening in the mind. Using Meditative Absorption to Enhance Your Meditation Skills Meditative absorption is a powerful method that can greatly speed up your progress through the ten stages. The whole-body practice described later is particularly helpful for letting go of discursive thoughts and will train your mind to enter a state of meditative absorption. We'll introduce other absorption practices in later stages. We're all familiar with what it's like to be absorbed in some activity. With the right conditions, this everyday kind of absorption can transform into the unique state called flow. In the words of the noted psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, flow is a state of concentration so focused that it amounts to complete absorption in an activity. Everyone experiences flow from time to time and will recognize its characteristics. People typically feel strong, alert, in effortless control, unselfconscious, and at the peak of their abilities. 
Both the sense of time and emotional problems seem to disappear, and there is an exhilarating feeling of transcendence. The Seven Conditions for Achieving Flow According to Csikszentmihalyi, for an activity to potentially lead to a state of flow, it must meet the following conditions. 1. The activity is performed as an end in itself, not for any other purpose. 2. The goals of the activity are clear and the feedback you get from it is immediate. The most important thing about that feedback is the symbolic message it contains. I have succeeded in my goal. Intention is followed by action. The outcome gets a positive evaluation, and feelings of pleasure and satisfaction reinforce the continued repetition of intention and action. This process creates a sense of order in conscious experience. 3. The activity is neither taxingly difficult nor too easy. The challenge of the task is perfectly balanced with the person's abilities. 4. The activity requires complete focus of attention, allowing only a very select range of information into awareness and leaving no room in the mind for anything else. All troubling or irrelevant thoughts are kept entirely at bay. Then, for that activity to actually transform into a flow state, these further conditions must arise. 5. The activity becomes spontaneous, almost automatic, and there is no sense of a self apart from the activity. 6. A feeling of effortlessness arises, even though continuous skilled performance is required. Everything happens seamlessly, as if by magic. 7. There is a sense of successfully exercising control, which is not the same as feeling like you are in control. Meditative absorptions are flow states that occur in meditation and are traditionally referred to as jhana. Tradition also defines the specific factors required for entering jhana. They are directed and sustained attention, vitaka vichara, exclusive focus and unification of the mind, chitas ikagara, ikodibhava, and joy and pleasure, piti sukha. If all these conditions are present, you will be in a state called access concentration, upachara samadhi. It's the state of concentration that immediately proceeds and from which you're able to access jhana. Put more simply, the state of concentration that immediately proceeds and provides access to jhana requires exclusive focus of attention, joy, and pleasure. Prior to stage six, if you became too absorbed with the meditation object, you quickly sank into dullness or got lost in distraction. But having overcome subtle dullness and temporarily subdued subtle distractions, you can enter states of absorption without that happening. Also, the acquired appearance of the breath is a far more suitable object for entering meditative absorption than the initial appearance. The jhanas you can enter at this stage are very light, which means that some amount of thinking, investigation, and evaluation will intrude, making the jhana unstable. Still, they're extremely useful for deepening concentration and unifying the mind. They're also very enjoyable. As you become an adept meditator, the mind grows more unified, access concentration becomes more powerful, and the jhanas you can achieve will be correspondingly deeper. Before attempting jhana the first time, thoroughly familiarize yourself with the seven conditions for achieving flow. They're a useful guide for creating exactly the right conditions for flow to arise. Entering the Whole Body Jhana The whole body jhana is the first meditative absorption you will practice. Prepare for it by intentionally cultivating a state of joy. Begin by purposely noticing and holding in awareness any feelings of stillness, alertness, and pleasure. You may also encourage these feelings, or even try invoking them intentionally. As you proceed to deepen your practice and move toward exclusive attention, make sure to keep these pleasant qualities in your awareness throughout every sitting. In fact, you should always do this, whether you intend to practice jhana or not. 
Again, the meditation object for this jhana is all the breath-related sensations occurring simultaneously throughout the entire body. You may arrive at this point by first working through every body part during the practice of experiencing the whole body with the breath, or maybe you're able to shift immediately from the nose to the whole body. It doesn't matter. The main difference is that instead of returning to the breath at the nose, when trying for jhana, you stay with the breath sensations in the whole body as your meditation object. Some background noise may still get through, and discursive thoughts may arise from time to time. That also doesn't matter, as long as there are periods of stable, exclusive attention, during which the breath sensations in the entire body are extremely clear. These periods of stable, exclusive focus combined with the metacognitive awareness of pleasure, will allow you to access jhana. Follow the sensations of the breath in the whole body as smoothly and seamlessly as possible. Each moment of doing your best is a success. Let all else fall away. Notice how pleasant the breath sensations are. They may take on a distinct vibrating quality. When everything is just right, your mind will seem to slip into a groove and begin to flow for a little while. The shift will be noticeable. You will recognize jhana as a distinct change in mental state. The same factors that define access concentration are present in jhana as well. What distinguishes access concentration from jhana is this shift into a flow state characterized by conditions five through seven. Yes, your mind will slip out of that flow. When that happens, just catch the gold ring again and return to the jhana. After some practice, the very process of returning to jhana when you slip out becomes part of the whole flow experience. Eventually, the periods spent in the jhana become longer and more pleasant. This is the first whole-body jhana. Yet beware, there's still a possibility for dullness. Although it doesn't happen often in jhana, you're vulnerable if awareness fades. You may continue experiencing breath-related sensations, but they will seem a little vague, like they're somehow disconnected from your overall awareness of the body. When this happens, the focus of attention usually shifts away from the breath sensations toward the feelings of pleasure and happiness. In Stage 7, you'll learn how to enter a deeper kind of jhana by actually focusing on joy and pleasure. But this is not the time. For now, if you ever find the focus of your attention shifting to pleasure, abandon the jhana and bring yourself to a state of full alertness immediately. Absorption without metacognitive awareness isn't really jhana, even if it's pleasant. If you accidentally train your mind to become dull in jhana, you'll have to unlearn that before you can use jhana to advance your practice. Practice this first jhana whenever conditions are right for access. Always notice exactly what's happening in the mind just before you enter jhana. You will thereby become more familiar with those conditions, and it will be easier to recreate them in the future. Develop skill at entering the jhana and remaining in it for longer and longer periods. It may take a while during any given session before you can reach jhana. Therefore, try to extend your meditation periods so you have enough time not only to enter jhana, but also to practice sustaining it. Jhana can be refined through four distinct phases, traditionally distinguished as the first, second, third, and fourth jhanas. If you can consistently enter and remain in this first whole-body jhana for up to fifteen minutes without interruption, you can start practicing the second jhana, also using the whole-body method. When you can easily do the same thing with that one, move on to the next. However, don't be in a rush. Build your skills. Until you have mastered stage six, keep practicing these whole-body jhanas. Don't worry about whether or not you practice all four of them. While helpful and pleasurable, jhanas are not an end in themselves. For now, their only purpose is to help you master stage six and prepare you for faster progress through the next stages. 
there are much deeper jhanas yet to come. Conclusion You have mastered stage six once you have subdued subtle distractions and can sustain a high level of metacognitive introspective awareness. Your mindfulness is quite strong, and you perceive the meditation object clearly and vividly. You also have complete control over your scope of attention, allowing you to examine any object with as broad or narrow a focus as you choose. When you sit, it takes a little while for attention to stabilize, but after that subtle distractions are more or less completely absent. Thoughts may intrude once in a while, but are often absent even from peripheral awareness. The sensations and sounds continue in peripheral awareness, but only rarely become subtle distractions. When they do, they are quickly and automatically corrected for. Remember, you've only subdued subtle distractions. You haven't permanently eliminated them. Therefore, you must stay continually vigilant to keep subtle dullness and distractions from returning. You have reached the second milestone achievement, sustained exclusive focus of attention. This is quite an accomplishment. You have now completed the development of skilled concentration. In Stage 7, you will make the transition to the practice of an adept. The most rewarding and joyous aspects of meditation await you. Sixth Interlude The Stages of an Adept Stages 7 through 10 describe the maturing practice of an adept meditator. This section of the path differs from previous stages in four important ways. First, you don't need to acquire any new skills. Just keep practicing the skills you've already mastered, and they'll produce profound changes in how the mind system works. Second, everything occurring in these stages is actually part of a single, continuous process, unification of mind. Third, as unification proceeds, you'll experience a variety of bizarre sensory phenomena, spontaneous body movements, and the arising of powerful energy. These accompany transformations occurring in the mind system and eventually culminate in the unique practice of physical pliancy and meditative joy. Fourth, the practice of an adept inevitably leads to powerful insight experiences, rich with the potential for actual insight. The Transition from Skilled to Adept Practice From Training the Mind to Transforming the Mind The transition from skilled to adept meditator essentially means shifting from training the mind to transforming the mind. Understanding this difference is very important. There are so many new methods introduced in the coming stages that it's possible to become preoccupied with technique. Successfully achieving shamatha while unwittingly dismissing insight opportunities as mere disruptions of your practice. Don't let this happen. The real point of adept practice is reshaping your mind into a powerful instrument capable of the kind of investigation that produces insight and awakening. Up to this point, all your progress has been the result of skill development. In stages four through six, you trained yourself so noticing and correcting for distraction or dullness became automatic. Now, as a meditator who's mastered the skills for stabilizing attention and generating powerful mindfulness, you can consistently achieve exclusive focus. However, the transition from skill development to transforming the way the mind works actually began in stage six with pacifying the mind. Continuously applying the skill of ignoring mental objects caused a shift in functioning of the mind system that kept the problem from arising in the first place. The discriminating mind stopped projecting mental objects into consciousness as potential distractions. Metacognitive awareness and the acquired appearance of the meditation object are other examples of shifts in mental functioning that resulted from simply continuing to exercise certain skills. The pacification in Stage 6 was only partial and temporary. 
because when you relaxed your effort, thoughts and other mental objects once again rose into consciousness to compete for attention. As pacification continues, in stage seven, however, an even more fundamental change in the mind system occurs, one that completely eliminates the cause of the problem. A significant proportion of the discriminating sub-minds, rather than simply growing quiet, become unified in support of the single, conscious intention to sustain an exclusive focus of attention. The result is complete pacification of the discriminating mind, also known as mental pliancy. With mental pliancy, exclusive focus and powerful mindfulness can be effortlessly sustained for long periods. These are the changes that make you an adept practitioner. In fact, everything from stage seven onward happens not because our skills improve any further, but because the mind system itself starts functioning differently. Specifically, by consistently applying the skills we've already mastered, the mind becomes more and more unified. This is the fundamental difference between the practice of an adept and everything that has preceded it. Skill Development versus Mastery To give you a sense of the difference between developing basic skills versus the exercise of mastery, think of what it means to become a virtuoso musician. First, you must master all the necessary skills, scales, chord progressions, ornamentations, and so on. Once those skills are mastered, you then move into the realm of artistry, which involves improvisation, mood, and nuance. Skills provide you with the foundation, but creative improvisation moves at another level and needs its own process of maturation. Yet another aspect of virtuosity is cooperative interaction. When playing in a group, any flourish added by one musician must fit in with the performance of the group as a whole. The same is true with unification of a multi-part mind system. Every sub-mind must function in a way that's harmonious with the rest of the system. An Overview of the Unification Process Stages 7 through 10 involve a profound unification of the mind. This doesn't mean the mind somehow fuses into a single, monolithic entity. Rather, the many discriminating and sensory sub-minds start working together in harmony. This unification is what gives rise to shamatha. This overview describes the sequence of events in the unification process and what happens at each stage. As you will see, some events unfold across several stages. For example, pacification of the discriminating mind begins at stage 6 and continues through stage 7. The relationship of individual stages to the overall process will become clear as we go along. Pacifying the mind began at stage six and continues into stage seven. The activities of the discriminating sub-minds have largely receded from consciousness, rarely appearing as anything more than indistinct whispers. Still, it takes continuous effort to keep these potentially distracting objects at bay. Complete pacification of the discriminating mind in stage seven means the discriminating sub-minds have become highly unified. By the end of this stage, you can effortlessly sustain stable attention and powerful mindfulness. This quality of effortlessness is called mental pliancy, which is the defining characteristic of the mind in stage eight. As unification of the mind as a whole proceeds, pacification of the senses begins. This process is similar to pacifying the discriminating mind, except it involves unifying the sensory sub-minds. It occurs mostly in stage eight, but can be a significant part of stage seven as well. With the senses fully pacified, all but the most intrusive external sounds fade away, and auditory awareness is often dominated by an inner sound. All visual imagery ceases, and the visual sense is often dominated by an inner light, and the usual bodily aches and pains, itching, numbness, and other sensations are replaced by a pleasant feeling of stability and stillness. 
With this further unification and the complete pacification of the senses, physical pliancy arises. Physical pliancy allows a meditator to sit for hours without physical discomfort or sensory distractions. When you get up after a long sit, you will feel strong and vigorous, without stiffness or limbs that have fallen asleep. Physical pliancy is accompanied by the bliss of physical pliancy. This is a wonderful feeling of bodily pleasure and comfort that seems either to suffuse the entire body from inside or else to cover it like a blanket or second skin of pleasurable sensation. Pacification of the senses, physical pliancy, and the bliss of physical pliancy can appear intermittently in stage seven, but only develop fully in stage eight. Meditative joy is a joyful state of mind arising due to further unification of the mind in stage eight. It's usually accompanied by an experience of powerful energy currents circulating through the body. Meditative joy fully matures shortly after physical pliancy, giving rise to the bliss of mental pliancy. This is a feeling of happiness. Meditative joy as a mental state is quite different from the bliss of mental pliancy, which is the pleasurable mental feeling that accompanies it. The state of meditative joy and the bliss of mental pliancy can be so intense and exciting that they become enormously distracting, so much so that a practitioner may stop meditating to go talk to someone about them. Meditative joy is consistently achieved in stage eight, and sustained meditative joy, along with the blisses of mental and physical pliancy, is the defining characteristic of stage nine. As you become more familiar with the state of meditative joy during the course of stage nine, there is a subsiding of intensity of the blisses of physical and mental pliancy. Meditative joy continues, but as the intensity and excitement fade, tranquility follows. As tranquility becomes strongly established, equanimity develops, meaning you no longer react to pleasant and unpleasant feelings the way you normally would. Both tranquility and equanimity are the fruits of stage nine and mark your entry into the tenth and final stage of adept practice. The mind is almost completely unified, and all five characteristics of shamatha, stable attention, samadhi, powerful mindfulness, sati, joy, piti, tranquility, pasadi, and equanimity, upekha, are now fully established. When the mind has become fully unified in stage ten, there is... Persistence of Shamatha Between Meditation Sessions A Summary of the Unification Process Pacification of the discriminating mind starts in Stage 6, continues in Stage 7 as the mind begins to unify, and culminates with the effortlessness of mental pliancy in Stage 8, at which point you have become an adept practitioner. Pacification of the senses starts in stage seven and finishes at the end of stage eight. With full pacification, physical pliancy and meditative joy arise, along with the blisses of physical and mental pliancy. The intensity of the blisses of physical and mental pliancy subsides in stage nine, giving rise to tranquility and equanimity. In stage ten, with the unification of mind almost complete, all five characteristics of shamatha are fully established. By the end of stage ten, the shamatha of the adept continues uninterrupted in daily life. Pacification of the Senses and Meditative Joy As the mind grows more unified, you will experience both complete pacification of the senses and the arising of meditative joy. The former begins with a variety of unusual sensory experiences that eventually lead to total quieting of the senses, as well as physical pliancy and the bliss of physical pliancy. Meditative joy, on the other hand, is preceded by distinctive energy currents, which increase in intensity until you experience the full fruition of joy and the bliss of mental pliancy. These two processes 
happen at the same time, and although they're connected, each has its own specific characteristics. We describe both processes in this interlude because they span stages seven and eight and don't neatly fit into a discussion of either stage. We'll first look at pacification of the senses and meditative joy separately, then discuss how they intermingle and complement one another. Pacification of the senses, from unusual sensations to physical pliancy. Pacification of the senses comes from consistently ignoring normal sensory information presented in awareness. Eventually, the sensory sub-minds stop projecting that content into consciousness at all. When this happens, it means the sensory sub-minds are unified around a common intention not to interrupt the focus of attention, resulting in complete pacification and physical pliancy. This temporary suspension of conscious information processing for all the senses is one of the two key features of full pacification of the senses. The other is that, with several of the senses, ordinary sensations not only disappear, but are replaced by internally generated perceptions. For example, you may see an inner light or hear an inner sound. These internally generated perceptions are quite different from imagination or memory. For one thing, they are much more real. They are also entirely spontaneous and can't be intentionally induced. Before pacification of the senses is complete, however, you'll experience a host of unusual, even bizarre sensory phenomena produced by the sub-minds. Even though these strange sensory experiences are so totally different from the internally generated perceptions of physical pliancy, they are, in fact, the precursors to them. Keep in mind that all these amazing, even fantastic-sounding pacification experiences have no significance in themselves except to indicate that the mind is growing more unified. Also, Unlike the meditation experiences that occur during the first six stages, the pacification process can differ significantly from person to person. You may well have experiences different from those we describe here. Nevertheless, the basic features should be recognizably the same. Pacification of the Bodily Senses as the process of pacification unfolds, you'll likely experience some bizarre physical sensations and autonomic reactions before you reach physical pliancy. For instance, you may encounter feelings of warmth or coolness on the skin. These may be stationary or moving, increasing or decreasing in intensity, and either pleasant or unpleasant. You may experience chills, shivers, skin flushing, hot flashes, and find your hairs standing on end. There may be itchiness or a sensation like insects crawling on your skin. You may encounter numbness, tingling, electric-like shocks, or sharp pinpricks. There can be pleasurable feelings in some particular body part, including sexual sensations, or there can be waves of pleasure spreading over the entire body. People often feel very light, as if they were floating, but there can also be sensations of heaviness and pressure, especially in or on top of the head. Another common sensation is of falling forward or to one side, or of the body or head twisting, even though no actual movement takes place. There may be dizziness and nausea as well. Some people experience only a few of these, while others may have to deal with them all. Most meditators fall somewhere in between. In any case, what you experience during the process of pacification is so different from complete pacification that you may find it hard to believe they are connected at all. Once the bodily senses are fully pacified, there will be a dramatic change during meditation in how you experience ordinary bodily sensations, proprioception, and the mental image you have of your body. Before pacification, when meditating, we're usually quite aware of many tactile and other bodily sensations, pain in the muscles and joints, burning and pressure where our body touches the cushion, 
temperature sensations and pressure and touch where body parts contact each other or our clothing. However, when the senses are completely pacified and physical pliancy arises, we cease to be aware of all these sensations. Instead, you may feel as though your body is completely empty inside, that there is nothing more than a thin membrane or shell at the surface of your body from which all sensations have disappeared. You'll have little more than a vague awareness of your body occupying space. Alternatively, you may experience the surface of your body as very fine, effervescent tingling or vibrations. Some say it feels like there is nothing but a fine energy field defining the space occupied by the body. Others find it hard to describe how their perception of the body is altered at all, except to say that none of the usual sensations are present. When pressure sensations disappear, it's common for meditators to report feeling as though they're floating in midair or weightless. But the most consistently reported experience is one of perfect stillness, accompanied by a wonderful sense of comfort and pleasure that uniformly pervades the body. Meditators have even described this pleasure as extending to the very tips of their hairs. Proprioception, awareness of the position and location of the parts of your body, also changes with complete pacification. When our eyes are closed, we usually know exactly where the parts of our body are and can accurately reach over and touch any part with our hand. With pacification of the bodily senses, however, it's not uncommon to feel as though your body is in a completely different position from what you know it to be, such as standing rather than sitting, arms straight rather than folded, or leaning over rather than sitting erect. Closely related to proprioceptive awareness is the internal mental image we have of our own bodies. Even when we're not consciously thinking about it, this image is always present somewhere in the background of body awareness. It's common for this image not to correspond exactly to what we see in the mirror or what gets captured by a camera. After all, who hasn't, at some time, experienced surprise when looking at themselves in a photograph? wondering if that's what they really look like. Yet when physical pliancy is fully developed, we can experience a mental self-image that differs even more radically from our actual appearance. For example, I, Chuladasa, am a rather funny-looking fellow with ears that stick way out and a face that shows the effects of time and too much sun. People often say I look a bit like Yoda. When I meditate, I sit cross-legged on a flat cushion with my right hand resting on my left hand in my lap. However, when I am in a state of physical pliancy, I sometimes have the perception that I'm standing upright. And even though one hand is resting on the other in my lap, it often feels like my right arm is extended downward. My mental image is of a beautiful face with smooth, glowing skin. Not every meditator will have experiences where the body seems to be in such a dramatically different position. But with physical pliancy, all meditators do tend to experience an altered mental image of themselves. There is no particular mystical significance to these self-images. In my case, I've spent a part of almost every day for the past twenty-five years in the presence of brass or wooden images portraying the Buddha standing with his right hand directed downward. I have these particular images because I like them. So the specifics of this self-image have more to do with familiarity, personal preference, and spiritual aspiration than with anything else. Please understand, we're not describing a trance-like state. Any strong or unusual tactile stimulus, say someone touching your shoulder, will register in consciousness, though you may prefer not to respond. This shows that the mind continues to process sensory information at an unconscious level. Also, all you need to do to become fully aware of ordinary tactile sensations is to intentionally shift your attention. You can easily move back and forth between isolated sensations and the altered perceptions of physical pliancy. Yet if your bodily senses are strongly pacified, 
it may take you a few moments to regain your normal awareness of the whole body. You might even need to move some part of your body to completely restore normal proprioception, especially if you've been sitting in physical pliancy for a long time. Typically, there's some inner resistance to giving up the pleasure of physical pliancy. Pacification of the Visual Sense Normally, even with our eyes closed, the visual mind isn't truly quiescent. It keeps searching for possible images to present in consciousness, though usually all we can see through our eyelids are subtle changes in light and shadow. Still, the mind tends to generate its own imagery, sometimes in abundance, a common distraction during meditation. Either way, it's rare for someone to experience a complete absence of visual awareness. As the visual sense becomes pacified, however, an inner illumination typically arises, which eventually dominates our visual field, replacing all other mental imagery. The earliest signs of this illumination phenomenon usually take the form of brief flashes, often colored, which may be weak or intense. However, you may instead experience a small bright point or disc that may or may not be colored, move, change in intensity, or expand and contract. Another early presentation of illumination is a shapeless brightness, as though someone were shining a light on your closed eyelids. This, too, may change in intensity or move. Alternatively, the illumination may appear diffuse, smoky, and indistinct, and may or may not be colored. These early illumination experiences tend to be brief, intermittent, and unpredictable. Everyone is different, so you may experience any of these, or not at all. For a few, the illumination phenomenon simply never happens. As pacification proceeds over time, illumination phenomena tend to become more frequent and last longer. They also tend to grow brighter and more stable, and eventually enlarge to fill your whole visual field. If the light is colored, it tends to fade to colorlessness. For some, illumination phenomena are subtle and may not emerge distinctly until all the other senses are pacified. It's best not to have expectations or judge the quality of your practice by the presence or absence of these phenomena. When the visual sense is fully pacified, the illumination phenomenon often takes the form of an all-pervading light, so-called because of its intensity and scope, and because it seems to come from no particular direction. However, you can also experience it as coming from the top of your head, from somewhere just above the head, from the center of your chest, or as radiating from your entire body. The all-pervading light is usually quite white, clear, or at most faintly tinted, but not always. It can become very bright without disturbing you. In fact, when physical pliancy is well established, illumination becomes such a familiar, consistent, and predictable part of meditation that you may even stop noticing it. When you open your eyes, the illumination disappears and normal vision instantly returns. Pacification of the Auditory Sense The auditory sense also produces unusual phenomena as it's pacified. However, unlike the other senses, these experiences won't change much or at all as pacification proceeds. That is to say, the auditory phenomena you'll encounter during pacification are much the same as what you'll experience once pacification is complete. Our usual awareness of external noises, inner dialogue, remembered or imagined sounds, or tunes in the head, gets replaced by a kind of white noise. You may hear humming, buzzing, whining, murmuring, or a ringing sound. It may remind you of crickets at night, flowing water, waves on the beach, or wind in the trees. For some, it resembles far-off music, which may be quite lovely. For others, it's less pleasant. The sound may rise and fall in pitch and or intensity, and the changes may be fast or slow. What's consistent, though, is that the sound comes from within and masks most external sounds, and that you'll eventually get so used to it that you no longer even notice. 
Some people have suggested that the sounds are of ordinary origin, such as blood flowing, air moving, or tinnitus, and were always there, but were only noticed in the silence and heightened awareness of meditation. Most meditators eventually become convinced it is none of these. Although some form of mind-generated white noise seems almost universal, some practitioners don't seem to notice it until prompted to reflect on their experience. They may even deny it occurs until they actually listen for it while in deep meditation. Still, it's possible there are people who don't encounter it at all. This inner sound serves no particular purpose, except perhaps to replace all but the most intrusive of external sounds. More generally, as each sense becomes pacified, you stop being consciously aware of stimuli, unless they're particularly intense or unusual. Therefore, you'll no longer be aware of traffic noises, barking dogs, or birds chirping. But you may still notice a door slamming or somebody shouting. You'll also still respond to sounds that are strongly associated with a conditioned response, such as the meditation bell. The fact that intense, unusual, or conditioned stimuli still register in consciousness show that the mind still processes auditory information at an unconscious level. Also, by intentionally shifting your attention, you'll once more become fully aware of ambient sounds. Pacification of the Senses of Taste and Smell When there's nothing to taste or smell, and when attention is not directed to these senses, they tend to remain completely absent from conscious awareness. Likewise, most meditators, even with physical pliancy, are simply unaware of any tastes or smells. Yet there is the occasional meditator who reports the scent of incense, flowers, or some other fragrance. There are also a few who experience a pleasant taste. These mind-generated perceptions are sometimes referred to as divine fragrances and nectars. Their presence in a few meditators, together with the absence of illumination phenomenon in some, and perhaps the absence of white noise in others, all demonstrate how pacification experiences can vary from person to person. The Significance of These Strange Sensations During pacification of the senses, it's as if the sensory minds react to being ignored by throwing up all sorts of strange and sometimes unpleasant sensations that have nothing to do with anything happening externally. Also, even though these inner lights and sounds may help prevent distraction by ordinary stimuli, they often don't appear until the senses have already begun to grow quiet. Thus, it appears inner light and sound are more a result of pacification than a contributing cause. However, arising as they often do, just when the practice has become tedious, they can provide encouragement and reassurance and boost motivation. Once they arise, they can easily become the focus of attention, and there are some practices, such as light, sound, and nectar meditations, that purposely cultivate these phenomena as meditation objects. The illumination phenomenon can be used to enter meditative absorptions, and this method will be discussed in Stage 8. In this system of practice, however, you are strongly advised to simply ignore most of these phenomena until sensory pacification is complete. Meditative Joy From Energy Currents to the Bliss of Mental Pliancy The feeling of energy currents moving through the body is related to and precedes the arising of meditative joy. These currents grow stronger and more defined as meditative joy becomes more fully established. Even though they are felt in the body and happen at the same time as the strange bodily sensations due to pacification of the senses, they are distinct from them. Energy currents and unusual bodily sensations only occur together because both are connected to the same underlying process, unification of the mind. Also, as we'll discuss, energy currents are ultimately of far more practical significance than the strange sensations during pacification. 
The earliest manifestations of energy are little more than an electrical tingling on the scalp or vibrations in different parts of the body. However, the full experience of energy currents can take any form, from sudden, intense, and unpleasant, to continuous, smooth, and extremely pleasant. Involuntary body movements often occur as part of these energy experiences as well, including twitching, especially of the hands and thumbs, jerking, swaying, rocking, bending the torso forward and or the head backward, muscle clenching, rolling and writhing movements of the shoulders and arms, and shaking or trembling. You may also experience sudden upward lurches, as though you were trying to leap into the air, involuntary vocalizations, chewing movements, and lip pursing. Common autonomic reactions are salivating, sweating, tears, and the occasional runny nose. Some meditators experience racing heartbeat or irregular heartbeats, as though your heart is turning over in your chest. Quite rarely there can be vomiting or diarrhea. As dramatic and unpleasant as these may be, you're in no real danger. Working with inner energy currents and channels is a recurrent theme in many traditions. This energy is variously called chi, prana, kriya, kundalini, or inner wind. There are detailed systems describing the channels, meridians, nadis, and chakras through which it flows, and there are powerful practices for working with this energy. Of all these traditions, the Theravada Buddhists have the least to say about energy movements. Their advice is simply to treat them the same way you treat any other experience that arises in meditation. Note it, let it be, and ignore it until it goes away. With a milder manifestation of energy, just letting it be is certainly the best advice, since it's so easy to get caught up in trying to control and manipulate it. Yet, as with everything else in this journey, there are tremendous variations in the intensity of the experience. For some, energy movements are subtle and quickly lead to pleasurable sensations pervading the whole body. Others undergo a prolonged process involving violent energy surges and painful blockages. If you experience these more intense manifestations, you may need to work intentionally with the energy in some way. Tai Chi, Qigong, and Yoga can all be helpful additions to formal meditation because they work directly with the energy movements in the body. Many meditators first encounter these energy currents in the form of sudden, violent jolts coursing up their spine. However, if you have practiced experiencing the whole body with the breath, described in Stage 6, you are already somewhat familiar with these energy currents and will be much better prepared to deal with them. Instead of being surprised by abrupt jolts of energy, you will instead experience a gradually increasing awareness of them that unfolds more predictably and systematically. 1. First, you become aware of subtle sensations in your limbs and extremities that rhythmically increase and decrease together with the breath. 2. As your practice proceeds, these subtle sensations clearly become sensations of expansion and contraction, or of pressure that alternately increases and decreases. 3. Eventually, you also become aware of a fine vibrational energy flowing out from the core of the body toward the extremities, then back. Sometimes the current will feel quite strong, like a powerful wave surging outward and back. More often, it feels like the whole body is gently rising and falling as the energy flows through it with each breath. 4. You'll observe the wave-like movement of energy is slightly out of phase with the breath. It also doesn't occur at exactly the same frequency as the breath, so the phase relationship between the breath and energy movements tends to change over time. 5. At some point, you become aware of energy moving up and down the spinal axis of the body. The upward movements from the base of the spine to the head are typically stronger and more distinct than the downward movements. Also, they often produce a sensation of pressure inside the head. 
the phase and frequency of the spinal energy movement eventually become completely dissociated from the breath. 6. If you're already aware of and following the energy from core to extremities before you experience these spinal currents, then their intensity tends to increase in a gentler, more gradual way. They may even be pleasant. However, if they're your first experience of energy currents, they may feel abrupt and painful, like a jolt of energy or an electric shock. One of the benefits of doing body scanning and experiencing the whole body with the breath is that you become familiar and more comfortable with these energy sensations earlier. 7. Finally, rather than alternating back and forth, the flow of energy becomes a continuous circular movement between the core and extremities and the base of the spine and the head. This coincides with the experience of strong meditative joy and sustained pervasive physical pleasure. Your perception of flowing energy may even extend beyond the body itself. You might sense a continuous energy exchange with the universe around you, taking place through the top of your head, the base of your spine, and your palms and soles. Remember, these energy currents are actually manifestations of unification of mind and lead to a mental state called meditative joy. There is absolutely nothing in the human body that corresponds anatomically to these energy currents or the channels through which they seem to move. This means that despite their intensity, these currents can't actually harm the body. Important Reminders About Extraordinary Experiences All these extraordinary experiences develop spontaneously as a result of continuing to practice. Remember, they serve no particular purpose and are irrelevant to the specific goals of each stage. However, they can be so unusual and fascinating that you'll find it hard to resist dwelling on them a bit. It's important that you don't disrupt your cultivation of physical pliancy and meditative joy by pursuing or deliberately trying to invoke them. This is especially true early on, when their appearances are brief and unpredictable. Later, when effortless concentration is well established and these phenomena stabilize, they are as suitable as any other object for close investigation. Pacification of the senses and meditative joy arise together. The Five Grades of Piti As the mind grows unified, the strange sensations leading to physical pliancy and the energy currents and involuntary movements preceding meditative joy all happen at the same time. The Theravada Buddhist tradition describes this intertwined process as five successive levels or grades of completeness of the development of piti. Piti is a Pali term often translated as ecstasy, delight, or rapture. Literally, the term refers solely to meditative joy. However, grades of piti refers to the entire developmental process, including sensory pacification and the blisses of physical and mental pliancy, as well as the gradual arising of joy. Therefore, when we discuss these grades of piti, we describe the way various unusual sensory and energetic experiences arise together at each grade. Grade 1 piti is called the minor grade and consists of brief, unpredictable episodes with only one or a few unusual sensations or involuntary body movements happening at once. For example, you might see some colored light, or experience a tingling sensation spreading over your face, or your thumbs might start twitching, followed by a pleasurable sensation in your hands and arms. Minor piti can occur at any stage, but rarely before stage four. It becomes more likely in stages five and six, and is almost always present by stage seven. Grade two piti, the momentary grade consists of brief episodes with a greater number of different phenomena occurring at the same time. You may experience lights, sounds, unusual bodily sensations and autonomic reactions, infrequently energy sensations and pleasurable sensations in the body, involuntary movements, and feelings of happiness may be present too. 
The episodes are brief, hence the description as momentary. Grade 2 PT is typical of stages 7 and 8, but is not unusual in stages 5 and 6. Grade 3 PT episodes last longer and are called wave-like because their intensity alternately increases and decreases. They are also described as showering because of the way intense sensations often spread over the body. The sensory phenomena and body movements tend to be much more intense compared to earlier grades. It's also common to feel energy currents. It can be hard to believe this tempestuous process is a pacification of anything. It's also not unusual to have a combination of both pleasant and unpleasant experiences, but the pleasant aspects will predominate as you move toward the next grade. Wave-like PT is a principal feature of stage 8, but is common in stage 7 as well. For a few meditators, it may also be a rare occurrence at earlier stages. Notice these first three grades of PT are mostly grades of incomplete pacification of the senses. But with the advent of grade 4 PT, pacification is largely complete. Some people do experience energy manifestations and involuntary movements in these three grades, and joy can make an occasional appearance in grade 3. But for many, this doesn't happen. The strong movements of energy that herald the arising of meditative joy are really most characteristic of grade 4 PT, and continue into grade 5. Grade 4 PT, the exhilarating grade, involves intense and sustained manifestations of physical pliancy. This means ordinary tactile sensations, as well as feelings of temperature and pain, are usually absent, and the body often feels light, or like it's floating weightlessly in midair. Distorted perceptions of the body's position and location are typical. The illumination phenomenon can also be particularly intense. Pleasurable sensations, such as experiencing the whole body as a field of very fine, rapid vibrations, and strong feelings of meditative joy, are intermittently present. The combination of intensity, sensations of floating, and meditative joy are probably why this grade is also known as uplifting piti. The description that best characterizes grade 4 PT, however, is incomplete and interrupted arising of meditative joy. The sensations of electricity or powerful energy currents will surge coarsely through the body. These are often accompanied by uncontrollable body movements such as the torso swaying back and forth, sudden violent jerks, or arms flinging. Grade 4 PT occurs almost exclusively in stage 8 but occasionally in stage 9. The exhilarating grade of PT eventually gives way to grade 5, pervading PT. This marks the full maturation of physical pliancy and meditative joy. You'll perceive energy currents circulating smoothly through the body, along with physical comfort, pleasure, stability, and intense joy. Recall that these different grades of PT are all phases in the process of unification. As the mind grows more unified, joy increases. When there's enough unification, the joy, along with the bliss of physical pliancy, becomes pervasive and lasting. Grade 5 PT marks mastery of stage 8 and entry into stage 9. Not everyone experiences all the transitional grades of PT. Some just encounter grades 1 and 2, with only minor symptoms like thumbs twitching or rocking movements, increased salivation, and mildly pleasant energy currents before they reach physical pliancy and meditative joy. Others progress one grade at a time, enduring months of unpleasant sensations, or even pain, twitching, itching, jerking, shivering, nausea, and sweating. The consolation for those who have a hard time is that they're typically the ones who report the most intense pleasure and joy in the end. Also, don't feel like you're missing out if you don't encounter the peculiar experiences that make up the various grades of pity. Some people don't. And all the drama, intensity, and ecstasy of pity are only incidental anyway. 
What matters most is making the mind into a serviceable instrument for achieving insight. Purification of the Mind Physical pliancy and meditative joy come quickly and easily for some, but slowly and arduously for others. Physiology and genetics may play a role, as do differences in temperament and psychological disposition. Physical, mental, and emotional health are also factors, which can be addressed through diet, exercise, good work and recreation habits, and appropriate therapy, if necessary. However, the biggest obstacles are often the hindrances of aversion and agitation due to worry and remorse. How we condition our mind on a daily basis has a powerful influence over these hindrances, and practices that purify the mind can be extremely helpful. The Hindrance of Aversion The hindrance of aversion keeps physical pliancy and the blisses of physical and mental pliancy from arising. Any negative mental state, such as impatience, fear, resentment, hatred, or a critical attitude toward ourself or others, can disrupt progress. Likewise, both stubbornness and a domineering or manipulative attitude can also create roadblocks. As long as any of these are present, even if we are not conscious of them, it will impede the flowering of pacification and physical and mental pliancy. That aversion opposes pleasure should not come as a surprise. It's harder to feel pleasure when we're angry, and harder to stay angry when we're feeling pleasure and happiness. But there's more to it than that, because aversion is a cause of pain, as well as an effect. Psychology and medical science have shown how unconscious mental processes, such as aversion, can find expression through bodily sensations and physical changes. We often become aware of our own emotions through unpleasant sensations in our stomach, chest, or throat, for example, or tension in our shoulders, forehead, or around the eyes, or from clenching our jaw. The body and mind are not distinct, but rather make up a complex, interconnected whole that can be called the body-mind. Likewise, unpleasant bodily sensations occurring during pacification often have their origins in deeply held but quite unconscious negative emotional states. This is the origin of the pain and discomfort that block physical pliancy. The Hindrance of Agitation Due to Worry and Remorse Agitation due to worry and remorse hinders the arising of meditative joy. Even if we are enjoying a stable, exclusive focus of attention and a mind seemingly free from thoughts, the discriminating mind still continues processing information and past experiences in the unconscious. Remorse for things we've done in the past and worries about what may happen in the future fester even when we're not consciously aware of them. This agitation manifests as intense but obstructed energy flows in the body. Meditative joy arises easily in a mind free from worry and remorse, but in their presence the joy is incomplete and cannot be sustained. Until we achieve some inner resolution, our past misdeeds will keep producing agitation. Likewise, until we overcome our fears about what may happen, worry will agitate the mind and prevent the full experience of meditative joy. Joy is a state of mind most easily understood by comparing it with its opposite, grief and sadness. Those who grieve are often filled with remorse. Sadness makes us pessimistic, lacking in confidence, and consequently we worry about all kinds of things. Joy, on the other hand, is associated with happiness, optimism, and confidence. Joyful people don't worry because they feel confident enough to deal with whatever comes their way. They also sincerely regret any harm they cause, are eager to set things right, and try to change their ways in the future. Remember, joy and sadness are incompatible mental states that simply cannot coexist. As your mind grows more unified through pacifying the senses, meditative joy begins to develop and as it increases, it eventually dispels agitation 
due to worry and remorse. However, don't just wait for this process to unfold on its own. Some powerful remedies. Please don't make the mistake of blaming yourself if you have these kinds of difficulties in meditation. And don't blame yourself for blaming yourself. No one comes to this practice without ample cause for aversion, worry, and remorse. Creating more self-directed negativity won't help. Instead, purify your mind of aversion and ill will to speed up and smooth out the process of pacifying the senses. The practice of loving-kindness meditation is a powerful and effective tool for this. Yet purification requires more than loving-kindness. We need to be mindful of our thoughts, emotions, and behavior at all times, and learn to let go of bad habits of thought, speech, and action. As an adept practitioner, you can no longer separate meditation from the rest of your life. The influence of your meditation practice of everything else you think, feel, or do, as well as the views you hold at other times, in other situations, is simply too great. To speed up and smooth out the arising of meditative joy, cultivate joy at every opportunity in daily life as well. Be mindful of pessimistic thoughts, and, to the best of your ability, avoid associating with pessimistic people. When you catch yourself worrying or doubting yourself, let go of those thoughts, and try to think about something positive instead. Resolve any lingering sources of worry and remorse, and find ways to right past wrongs and seek forgiveness for past misdeeds wherever possible. Own your mistakes. Make amends. Ask for others' forgiveness. And forgive yourself. It's also essential to practice virtue in daily life. By refraining from unwholesome behavior and engaging in virtuous actions, you'll no longer act in ways that create the conditions for future worry and remorse. The practices of generosity, virtue, patience, and joyful effort are indispensable for success in the more advanced stages, and will yield immeasurable benefits in the rest of your life as well. To help you along this path of purification, take up the Mindful Review practice. Mindful Review turns daily reflection into a powerful tool for personal change. Although this practice is appropriate at any stage, it's essential for making progress as an adept. We waited until now to introduce it only because it can easily be mistaken for an empty, moralistic ritual. Yet the sooner you begin this practice or another systematic technique that cultivates mindfulness, virtue, generosity, and patience in daily life, the faster you'll progress on the cushion. His mind is not overcome with passion, not overcome with aversion, not overcome with delusion. His mind heads straight, based on the Tathagata. And when the mind is headed straight, the disciple of the Noble Ones gains a sense of the goal, gains a sense of the Dhamma, gains joy connected with the Dhamma. In one who is joyful, rapture arises. In one who is rapturous, the body grows calm. One whose body is calmed experiences ease. In one at ease, the mind becomes concentrated. Mahanama Sutta Inside Experiences and the Attainment of Insight You've likely gained a lot of insight as a result of your practice by now. Insights into why you think and react the way you do how your mind works, and better ways of dealing with life situations. I'm referring to the ordinary insights that help us in our life, but don't radically transform how we understand the world and our place in it. However, from this point forward, we will increasingly have insight experiences that can trigger the kind of insight, vipassana, that leads to awakening. What makes them insight experiences is the way they challenge your understanding of how things are by clearly demonstrating they're different from what you previously believed. This type of insight is the real goal of meditation practice. First, powerful insight experiences will happen more frequently, both in meditation and daily life, because of how you've trained and used your mind. 
In the stages that follow, we introduce a range of practices specifically intended to induce insight experiences. Second, these experiences are now far more likely to give rise to actual insight, since mindfulness in the form of metacognitive awareness doesn't allow them to go unrecognized. This may come as a surprise, but insight experiences aren't uncommon, even among people without meditation training. They just tend to be overlooked, ignored, or simply dismissed. Even meditators sometimes just treat them as a nuisance, distraction, or obstacle to perfecting their skills. Whether or not these experiences bear fruit as actual insight depends on the meditator's ability to properly appreciate and engage with them as they arise. When we have more stable attention and powerful mindfulness, they are far more likely to sink in as experiential realities, forcing unconscious sub-minds to revise deeply held views at an intuitive level. As insight accumulates, your understanding of yourself in relationship to the world changes. This happens at such a fundamental level that the effects can be enormously unsettling. This is normal and, in fact, inevitable. In other words, we're giving you a heads-up that awakening is not without its price of admission. Let's look at why this can be so difficult by first summarizing the universally accepted worldview. Whether we're consciously aware of it or not, that view is the foundation of all our beliefs, actions, aspirations, and our very sense of meaning and purpose. 1. I am a separate entity, a self, in a world of other distinct entities. 2. My happiness and unhappiness depend on the interactions between myself and those other entities. 3. I rely on my presumed ability to understand and predict how this world works in order to control or influence those interactions in a way that maximizes my happiness and minimizes my suffering. The truth revealed by insight stands in stark contradiction to these assumptions, and unfortunately, before insight can give rise to a greater liberating truth, this old foundation must fall away. This is not a pleasant experience, and the emotional distress it produces can sometimes be extreme. If you recall from the introduction, there are five key insights that lead to awakening. Impermanence, emptiness, the causal interdependence of all phenomena, the nature of suffering, and the illusoriness of a separate self. The fifth, insight into no self is the culminating insight that actually brings awakening. Immature insight into the first four of these, but not the fifth, is what produces the most difficulty. In other words, as long as we cling to the notion of self, the implications of the other insights are deeply disturbing. Consider what it's like for our unconscious sub-minds when, still clinging to the view that we are a separate self, they must assimilate. The fact of impermanence, that there is only change and there's nothing to cling to or rely on. The fact of emptiness, that nothing is the way it appears and the world is ultimately unknowable except through our limited capacity for inference. And the fact that everything is causally independent, which destroys all illusions of control. In the calculus of insight, it's the continued clinging to the notion of separate selfhood in the face of these three insights that produces a first-hand experience of insight into the nature of suffering. Realizing that you're not a separate self is what resolves this apparently hopeless situation. This isn't the place to discuss why this is or how it happens, but anything that loosens your attachment to the notion of self will help. Fortunately, there are ways of easing this transition. These factors will minimize the psychological trauma associated with maturing insight and smooth the transition to awakening. 1. How successful you were in allowing the emotional purifications of stages 4 and 7 to fully unfold so you're not forced to experience them as part of the insight process. 2. How much of the meditative joy of stages 7 and 8 
the tranquility of stage nine and the equanimity of stages nine and ten you've been able to cultivate. Three, how clearly you understand the illusoriness of the separate self. Anatta. Four, how fully you've experientially verified for yourself the descriptions of the mind system presented in the fifth and seventh interludes. Five, how effective you've been in reducing self-clinging and subsequent craving by using the mindful review practice. Self-conquest is far greater than conquering all others. Not gods, nor angels, nor Mara or Brahma can overturn such a victory. Dhammapada, verses 104 to 105. Stage 7. Exclusive Attention and Unifying the Mind. 7. The goal of Stage 7 is to effortlessly sustain exclusive attention and powerful mindfulness. With the conscious intention to continuously guard against dullness and distraction, the mind becomes completely accustomed to effortlessly sustaining attention and mindfulness. Practice Goals for Stage 7 You enter Stage 7 as a skilled meditator. You can achieve uninterrupted, exclusive attention— along with a powerful mindfulness that includes continuous metacognitive awareness. At first, it can take some time and effort in each meditation session to reach this level of focus, and there will still be days when you can't quite get there. Also, as wonderful as these new abilities are, you can only sustain them through ongoing effort and vigilance. Any lapse can lead to a loss of focus, and if not quickly corrected for, the return of subtle distractions, and even dullness. This constant watchfulness and the subtle effort needed to sustain exclusive focus, which continues throughout most of Stage 7, is tiring and quickly mars the initial satisfaction you felt at your achievement. Stage 7 is about the transition from being a skilled meditator to an adept meditator one who can constantly achieve and effortlessly maintain exclusive attention and powerful mindfulness. Achieving effortlessness is your goal for this stage. Effortlessness requires complete pacification of the discriminating mind, which is also the essential first step in unification of mind. Until there is unification, unconscious sub-minds continue to be at odds with each other, creating instability. With complete pacification, however, there is enough unification that the mind is compliant and rarely needs correction. Thus, an adept meditator can drop all vigilance and effort, allowing the mind to settle into an unprecedented state of inner calm and clarity. To bring about unification and complete pacification, you simply keep applying effort until it's no longer needed. However, because exerting effort has become such a strong habit, knowing when you can safely drop it is a separate challenge all its own. Then, even when you know effort is no longer needed, you'll still have to learn to let go of being in control. You'll also encounter a few other obstacles at this stage. Long periods of maintaining exclusive focus through vigilance and effort are necessary, and they seem very dry because not much happens. This can create doubt, boredom, and restlessness. Other times you may experience unusual and often unpleasant sensations that challenge your ability to stay focused, and your body may jerk, twitch, or rock back and forth. These are, of course, manifestations of the early stages of PT described in the sixth interlude. Occasionally you may also find yourself overwhelmed by feelings of joy. There's also a good chance you'll have to go through further purifications similar to those in Stage 4. Your powers of patience, determination, and diligence will be tested and retested. But remember, these are all part of the unification process. Therefore, ignore all these distractions, remain diligent in your practice, and you will certainly succeed. You have mastered Stage 7 when you can consistently let go of all effort 
yet stable attention and powerful mindfulness persist. You have completely pacified the discriminating mind and made your first great strides toward unifying the mind. Complete Pacification of the Discriminating Mind Complete pacification of the discriminating mind means that the competing agendas of all the individual thinking, emotional sub-minds get set aside in favor of a single, consciously held intention. In other words, the mind system as a whole becomes more fully unified around the conscious intention to attend exclusively to the breath. When competing intentions are eliminated, attention naturally becomes more stable. Although this pacification process started in stage six, it was only temporary. Pacifying the mind in that stage meant that when we successfully ignored mental objects long enough, the discriminating mind projected fewer of them into consciousness. But this state was sustained only by the strength of our intention to ignore all distractions. If that intention ever weakened, the unconscious sub-minds of the thinking, emotional mind began to project thoughts into consciousness again. In stage seven, you must remain diligent and exert effort to maintain pacification until there's enough unification for complete pacification to occur. Then you can drop vigilance and effort and sustain stable attention effortlessly. The instructions for completely pacifying the discriminating mind are simple. Just keep doing what you've been doing. Remember, you don't pacify your mind. It happens by itself when you repeatedly achieve exclusive attention and sustain it for as long as possible. Practice experiencing the whole body with the breath only as needed toward the beginning of this stage to achieve exclusive attention. Maintain a high level of introspective awareness so that whenever a potential distraction emerges in the periphery, you can immediately strengthen the focus of your attention on the breath. In doing so, you're also renewing the intention to ignore potential distractions. Learn to appreciate the simplicity and pleasure of exclusive attention. Habituating the Mind to Exclusive Attention Constant repetition habituates the discriminating mind to exclusive attention and increasingly powerful mindfulness until we have the experience of complete pacification and effortlessness. Whenever we sustain exclusive focus, the mind system's executive functions are overriding the intentions of other sub-minds. This override trains unconscious sub-minds of the discriminating mind not to project their content into consciousness. Furthermore, by enjoying the experience of exclusive attention, by savoring the pleasurable, restful silence it produces, we're training some of those sub-minds to adopt the intention to be vigilant and immediately correct for distractions. As a result, Whenever something arrives in peripheral awareness, accompanied by an intention to become an object of attention, the trained sub-minds respond by projecting an opposing intention. As you can see, the subjective experience of pacification is not caused by the discriminating sub-minds going dormant. They are as active as ever. In this case, they actively participate in the intention to sustain exclusive attention. This is how and why exclusive attention becomes effortless. Diligence, Vigilance, and Effort The path to complete pacification can be summed up in a single word. Diligence. Diligence means constantly persevering. It's the center from which vigilance and effort radiate to create a primed and engaged mental state. Vigilance means having introspective peripheral awareness that's clear, alert, and ready to detect whatever may threaten the stability of your attention. Like a vigilant sentry, awareness is purposely watchful for any potential distractions. Vigilance also takes some effort, but most of the effort goes into attention. You constantly generate the intention both to remain exclusively focused on the details of the breath and to immediately correct for potential distractions. So diligence underlies both vigilant introspective awareness 
as well as the effortful intention needed for exclusive attention. Such diligence takes a lot of energy. In a way, it's like learning to juggle. At first, you have to constantly coordinate many different activities, speed, timing, posture, watching for errors, making corrections, and so on. Once you have a little experience, you can consistently keep the balls in the air. But it's still tiring. Maintaining exclusive focus of attention in Stage 7 is similar. You can do it, but it's hard to keep up for long. The other challenge is that you've been so successful in your practice to reach this stage, it's easy to back off on the effort. Yet it only takes a brief instance of slackening to be suddenly caught by a distraction and for the balls to drop. Similarly, if you're ever tempted to rest on your accomplishments, you can easily slip into a state of cruise control. In meditation, cruise control means slipping into a state of subtle dullness. And if you don't catch that subtle dullness, it's only a matter of time before you're distracted again. After lots of practice, an expert juggler no longer needs to focus so intensely, and can even carry on a conversation while effortlessly keeping the balls in the air. Riding a bike is another example of an activity that eventually becomes effortless through consistent effort. And so is meditation. Therefore, even though all this effort seems to contradict the goal of effortlessness, it must be continued until it's no longer necessary. As you progress, everything will become more and more automatic. But what truly produces effortlessness is the fact that unconscious sub-minds no longer try to take over. Effortlessness means attention is placed on the object and stays there because there's nothing in the background trying to draw it away. Then, and only then, is there complete pacification, meaning diligence, effort, and vigilance can cease. The Problem of Dryness With diligence, you can stay highly focused and alert for longer and longer. As you do, however, the satisfaction and excitement you feel at the end of stage six starts to wear off. Periods when the meditation feels satisfying become interspersed with periods that feel dry and tedious. Nothing new happens. Any lapse in diligence, and you'll lose your focus and mindfulness. Yet all this effort no longer brings the satisfaction it once did. People often feel stuck or doubtful. What's the matter? Maybe I'm doing something wrong. We can get caught up in strong feelings of restlessness and impatience instead of just recognizing them as mind-generated distractions. The temptation to give up and do something else can be great. I personally had a long stretch of tedious practice at this stage. I didn't know it was a normal part of the process, and remember thinking, my concentration is nearly perfect, I sit day after day, and this is all I have to show for it? What's the point? Where's the rapture and bliss I've heard about? Unfortunately, I quit practicing for quite a while as a result. This can be a dangerous time for your progress because of boredom and doubt. But it's easier to tolerate if you understand what's going on and are expecting it. Fortunately, most people at this stage will have occasional episodes of joy and pleasure, piti sukha, and experience unusual bodily sensations, involuntary movements, and colors and lights. These are brief, infrequent, and unpredictable, but nonetheless break the monotony, helping to overcome doubt and keep us motivated. But the real antidote is confidence in your abilities and trust that it's a process that just takes time to mature. When you feel stuck, restless, and doubtful, Try not to react to those feelings. Instead, cultivate an attitude of acceptance and patience. When they arise, just notice and accept them. Resettle your attention on the meditation object and try to regain a sense of peacefulness and calm to counter the restlessness. Also, take as much satisfaction as possible in just how far you've come, reminding yourself that if you persevere, the rewards will surely follow. You should also review the first interlude on hindrances and problems, especially doubt and impatience. 
There are three additional practices you can do to add variety to your meditation and help you through these dry periods. An investigation into the nature of thoughts through introspective awareness, an intense form of close following, and practicing the pleasure jhanas. These practices are all very rewarding in themselves while still unifying and training the mind in stable attention and mindfulness. Investigation of Mental Objects This practice involves maintaining exclusive focus on the breath as you non-discursively investigate mental objects with metacognitive introspective awareness. This kind of purposeful activity helps counteract feelings of boredom due to the dryness of this stage, while deepening your understanding of how the mind works at the same time. Observing the breath has become quite automatic by now, and this practice requires only a partial shift of conscious power from attention to metacognitive awareness. Because you're maintaining exclusive attention on the breath, pacification of the discriminating mind continues. By this point in your practice, mental objects such as thoughts, memories, and emotions rarely enter consciousness. When they do, they are easily noticed. To begin with, observe the three primary forms that thought takes. Self-talk, visual images, and kinesthetic feelings. Thoughts are often in the form of words, phrases, or sentences, and can easily become long inner dialogues. Other thoughts take the form of images, such as when you think of cooking dinner and have an image of your kitchen. Memories are often verbal or visual as well. You're doubtless quite familiar with these kinds of thoughts. The third kind are when we kinesthetically feel ourselves doing something, such as the thought or memory of picking up a phone and dialing. Emotions also fall in the kinesthetic category. Just as you can have the kinesthetic memory of a physical act, you can have the kinesthetic experience of an emotion like jealousy. In the course of this inquiry, you'll be especially aware of symbolic thought. The words and phrases that appear as inner self-talk are obviously symbolic, standing for something other than themselves. But so are mental images and the mental representations of physical actions, like the urge to scratch your nose, for example. One of the things you may also notice is the incredible speed of symbolic thought. It's so fast that individual thoughts, especially the components of individual thoughts, such as a particular word or image, are fleeting and hard to identify. In those intervals when symbolic thought is absent, we can legitimately say no thoughts are present. Yet as you keep observing, you'll start to notice a lot of mental activity and peripheral awareness that is pre-verbal, pre-image, and pre-sense it. This reflects the ongoing conceptual activity of the thinking emotional, and is what gives rise to symbolic thought. We are not ordinarily conscious of non-symbolic conceptual thought, but it starts to leak through when conscious experience is no longer dominated by symbolic thought. Times when thought seems completely absent are well worth observing, too. When the mind is engaged in the present without grasping, neither looking to the future nor the past, then joy, happiness, and energy arise. This often happens during walking meditation, or with any ordinary kind of concentration where we become totally immersed in the present. It happens here in stage seven, too, but can easily go unnoticed. Being fully aware of joy and happiness directly counters the dryness of this stage and promotes unification and pacification of mind. Close Following This practice is a more intense version of the following the breath technique you learned earlier. Only this time you want to identify even more thoroughly the many distinct sensations that constitute the breath at the nostrils. Set your intention to follow the microscopic movements of sensations. As you focus in more and more, you might discern half a dozen or many more different sensations for each in-and-out breath. As you continue to examine these sensations quite closely, your perception shifts and you'll start experiencing the breath as jerky or pulsing rather than smooth and continuous. 
the jerks typically come at about one or two pulses per second. At first, it may seem like it's just your heartbeat you're feeling, or that your heartbeat is somehow affecting the breath. You can investigate this by intentionally expanding your scope of attention to include both your heartbeat and the breath sensations. If you can't clearly perceive your heartbeat apart from these pulsations, then put your finger on your carotid artery, focusing attention on both your pulse and the breath at the nose. Continue to maintain exclusive attention and introspective awareness, of course. You'll eventually discover that the pulsations of your breath don't actually coincide with the beating of your heart. Once you've satisfied your curiosity, look more closely at the content of each jerk. You'll find continuous change occurring within each one, as though they were made of very short clips from a motion picture. The changes consist of recognizable sensations, like warmth, coolness, pressure, movement, and so forth, arising and passing away. Yet as you probe deeper, you'll start detecting subtler sensations you can't easily label. You're now reaching a much finer degree of discrimination. If you continue, at some point your perception will shift again. Instead of pulsations, within each of which there is continuous change, you'll experience what feels more like a series of still frames, occurring at about ten per second. Here you're giving the mind an activity to perform that produces novel experiences. What makes it useful for your practice is that you can only sustain this investigation by staying vigilant and highly focused. Any slackening of attentional effort or vigilance will lead to disrupting distractions. If you're lucky, perception will shift one more time. The still frames will dissolve, becoming something too rapid for the mind to clearly discern. You will then experience the breath sensations as the rapid flickering on and off of separate moments of consciousness, or simply as vibrations. Some meditators interpret this experience of momentariness as the universe continuously coming into and going out of existence. That description is quite accurate in terms of a person's subjective universe. When this happens, there's nothing the mind can recognize or hold on to, so it naturally recoils from the experience. The mind jumps back, so to speak, to a place where things are recognizable once again, where it can apply familiar labels and concepts to what is being experienced. This is an insight experience. If you can re-enter this vibratory experience, you can gain clear insight into impermanence. You may realize that all there ever was, is, or will be, is an ongoing process of constant change that cannot be grasped or clung to. Things don't actually exist. Process is all there is. Then, if you can overcome the mind's resistance enough to go in and out of this perceptual state repeatedly, it will become an insight experience from which you can gain insight into emptiness. First, you'll observe how uncomfortable the mind is with that level of perception, and how desperately it wants to pull back and organize this experience conceptually. Then you'll realize, at a very deep level, that the familiar world of forms is shaped entirely by the mind's attempt to make sense of an empty reality. Dharma teachers often speak about the world as being merely a projection of the mind. This direct experience of the mind creating meaning out of emptiness allows us to understand exactly what they're referring to. It's not that the world doesn't exist. Rather, the world you perceive, your personal reality, is nothing more than a construct of your mind. These realizations happen if you're really lucky. But there are two significant caveats. First, if you spend a lot of time doing this practice, you'll have a spillover into your daily life. You'll see everything as impermanent, which can really throw you off. Familiar feelings of certainty and purpose disappear, which can produce a sense of hopelessness, even despair. Things lose their usual importance, and life can seem pointless. And it's all the more disconcerting because these emotions have no logical basis in conscious experience and seem to come from nowhere. 
In fact, they are produced by unconscious mental processes trying to assimilate your meditation experiences. In the Theravada tradition, this state is called the knowledge of suffering, dukkha nanas, and is in some ways comparable to the dark night of the soul in the Christian mystical tradition. These insights into impermanence and emptiness can create aversion to practicing. But stopping your practice is probably the worst thing you can do in this situation. The second caveat is, don't count on having these types of inside experiences. Some people never experience sensations dissolving into a field of fine vibrations. Others don't recoil from the experience, but actually find it delightful and intriguing. If you fall into the latter group, you can expand your scope of attention to include the whole body, experiencing it as a shimmering process of sensation too subtle to describe easily. Remember, the purpose of this practice is mainly to help you overcome the dryness of stage seven and to continue strengthening exclusive attention and mindfulness. It's a creative way of applying your abilities to help you practice more productively. There's a strong possibility it will produce inside experience, but it's not guaranteed. If they don't come now, rest assured they will come later. Pleasure Jhana Practice The pleasure jhanas are a more powerful and satisfying absorption than the whole body jhanas. As the name indicate, you use pleasurable sensations as your meditation object. The pleasure jhanas are particularly helpful in countering the tediousness of this stage. More important, the state of flow in jhana induces a temporary unification of mind, which in turn promotes more lasting unification, thus speeding up your progress through stage seven. To have access to the pleasure jhanas, you'll need exclusive attention to the breath of the nose. Both mind and body must be quite stable and still. Your subjective experience should be one of sustained stillness, stability, and mental clarity. Your breath will be slow and shallow, and the sensations faint. Nevertheless, your awareness of the sensations will be so acute it almost hurts. It's normal to still have peripheral awareness of occasional sounds or other sensations, perhaps even the faint whisper of a fleeting thought. You know they are happening, but like the awareness of clouds in the sky or cars passing on the street, they barely qualify as conscious experience. Even so, if you relax your vigilance, they can still draw your attention away. Achieving the flow state of jhana will change that. When you have achieved this level of access concentration without shifting your attention from the breath, explore peripheral awareness to find a pleasant sensation. They can be just about anywhere, but try looking in the hands, the middle of the chest, or the face. If you have trouble finding a pleasant sensation somewhere in your body, Try smiling slightly. This is very helpful and often produces a pleasant feeling around the mouth or eyes. In fact, smiling when you meditate is a good habit to cultivate in general. By the time you arrive at access concentration, the fake smile you put on when you started meditating will have become genuine. Once you've found a distinctive, pleasant sensation, shift your attention to it. Staying focused on a mildly pleasant feeling won't be as easy as focusing on the sensations of the breath. You will even find your attention wants to return to the breath, because focusing on it has become a strong habit. Practice just letting the breath sensations stay in the background while remaining introspectively aware of how attention alternates between the pleasant sensation you've chosen and the breath. It usually doesn't take too long to get the hang of this. Then attention will no longer alternate at all, becoming exclusively focused on the pleasant sensation. Focus your attention, in particular, on the quality of pleasantness rather than the sensation that gives rise to the pleasantness. Just observe, letting yourself become completely immersed in the sensation, but don't do anything. Let the pleasantness intensify. Sometimes, though, it will fade away. In that case, allow your attention to return to the breath. 
stay in access for another five minutes or so, enhancing your peripheral awareness to allow any physical or mental pleasantness to arise. Once it does, try again. Sooner or later, the pleasant feeling will intensify as you keep focusing on it, which makes it easier to remain attentive. Pleasantness won't necessarily grow stronger in a linear or continuous manner, so be patient. As long as it doesn't fade away, just observe without reacting. Definitely don't push or chase after it. If you do, it will simply fade, and you'll have to return to the breath for a while and try again. As the pleasantness builds, you may experience unusual sensory phenomena, including strong energy sensations that can cause trembling and spontaneous movements. These are distracting and can be hard to ignore, but just hold the intention to let them remain in the background of awareness. Don't be concerned if attention starts alternating with them, as it did earlier with the breath. That won't stop absorption from happening. In fact, if you're lucky, you may experience a release of this energy, accompanied by strong, pleasant sensations in the body, and a brief period of joyful happiness. This gives you a taste of what's to come in the first pleasure jhana. The pleasantness will grow incrementally stronger, in fits and starts, until it suddenly takes off. You feel as if you're sinking into the pleasant sensation, or as if it has expanded to consume all your available conscious bandwidth. You've entered the flow state that is the first pleasure jhana. If you've already practiced the whole-body jhanas, you'll immediately recognize the feeling. Trembling and energy sensations tend to persist in this first jhana. When you can easily enter the first jhana and remain as long as you choose, consider moving on to the second pleasure jhana. The physical sensations and movements grow more stable in the second jhana, and the feeling of happiness becomes more pronounced than the physical pleasure. While pleasure jhana practice doesn't have the same potential for insight as close following, it's a far more enjoyable way to cultivate effortlessness. Distraction due to strange sensations While you're well on the way to pacifying the discriminating sub-minds, the sensory sub-minds still function as they always have. Pacification of the senses begins in stage seven because you're ignoring all distractions including sensory input, in order to completely pacify the discriminating mind. As discussed in the previous interlude, pacifying the senses produces a variety of bizarre sensory experiences. Because they are intense and unusual, and especially because they break the tedium of long dry periods, these sensations can be very powerful distractions. It's almost as though the senses produce these strange sensations in an attempt to catch your attention. You may have already experienced some strange sensations from time to time, such as tingling, or a feeling of bugs crawling on your skin, burning sensations, or feeling a cold draft from nowhere, pressure on the top of your head, or distorted body sensations. You may have seen lights behind your closed eyelids, or heard noises with no external source. Such sensations probably occurred when attention was particularly stable and would have been brief and easy to disregard once you realized they weren't important. They were manifestations of grade one PT, the minor grade discussed in the last interlude. At this stage, you can expect these unusual sensations to happen much more frequently, last longer, and be more intense. Also, while they used to occur mostly one at a time, now several arise at once. These are episodes of incomplete pacification of the senses, belonging to momentary, grade two, pity. You will often feel energy coursing through your body, as well as physical movements, including rocking, sudden jerking, and twitching of the hands and fingers. Sweating, salivation, and tears can occur as well. You may even experience incomplete sensory pacification corresponding to grade three, in which multiple sensory phenomena arise together, repeatedly becoming very intense and then subsiding in a wave-like pattern. Moments of intense joy and happiness can also occur, but not sustained periods of meditative joy. That will come in stage eight. 
Just do your best to ignore these phenomena, letting them mature on their own over time. Don't chase after them, but don't push them away or resist them either. They will arise and pass away according to their own agenda. Your task is just to let them come, let them be, and let them go. At the end of the next stage, once your senses have been fully pacified, these strange sensations will actually give rise to physical pliancy and fully developed meditative joy. Calming the bodily formations while breathing in, he trains himself. Calming the bodily formations while breathing out, he trains himself. Anapanasati Sutta Purification of Mind Revisited At this stage, you may also re-encounter the purification process you experienced in Stage 4. This comprises another major set of distractions, including strong emotions, disturbing images, powerful memories, and other volatile material. This purification process is extremely important. In fact, your progress through the remaining stages depends on it. So welcome this process if it arises. Deal with these issues in exactly the same manner as in Stage 4. If you need to, listen to that chapter again and refresh your memory. Why didn't these issues come up in Stage 4? Most likely because they were met with too much inner resistance at the time, were too deeply buried, or were just too subtle to be recognized earlier. If you haven't already, start using the mindful review practice. This practice will stir up material needing purification so it can more readily emerge in the silence of meditation. By confronting your present attitudes and behaviors as part of the mindful review practice, you lessen your resistance to those deeper issues. Unification of the Discriminating Mind and Recognizing Effortlessness Before unification, many unconscious sub-minds have conflicting intentions. Through the pacification process, sub-minds of the discriminating mind start coming together around the common intention to focus on the sensations of the breath. With this growing consensus, there are fewer dissenting sub-minds to project distracting mental objects into peripheral awareness. Recognizing effortlessness is like learning to ride a bike. There's that moment when you realize that if we stop constantly trying to correct and control and just keep pedaling, the bike will stay upright by itself. In the same way, when meditating, we need to learn to let go when the time is right, moving into effortlessness. This sounds easy enough. However, you've been making an effort for so long that you may not recognize it isn't necessary anymore. The mind has grown so accustomed to maintaining intense levels of vigilance and effort that doing so has become automatic. In addition, this diligence actually keeps the natural joy of a unified mind from arising. You certainly may have experienced short bursts of joy, but the joy that comes from unification is still being blocked by habitual diligence. Letting go is the best way to discover if the time is right to drop all vigilance and effort. Just intentionally relax your effort from time to time and see what happens. If distraction or dullness returns, you know you need to keep making effort. However, if exclusive attention continues, mindfulness remains strong and joy and happiness arise, you've achieved effortlessness. Still, don't be in a hurry. If you drop diligence too often and too soon, your practice becomes inconsistent, which can hold you back. Wait until you have some sign that the time may be right. You might notice, for instance, that no mental objects have appeared in peripheral awareness for a very long time, or perhaps your overall mental state is much calmer and clearer. Or again, you might notice that even strange or unpleasant physical sensations are much easier to ignore since no thoughts arise in reaction to them. These are the signs of mental pliancy. When you observe them, it's time to let go of that watchful feeling of being instantly ready to defend your focus.
an accidental discovery of effortlessness. The Epiphany of the Flies I wasn't taught to let go intentionally in order to test for effortlessness. In fact, I wasn't even aware that I should be striving for effortlessness at all. The discovery was a complete accident. I had been in a very long, very dry period of practice, with only a few minor signs of pity, thumbs and hands twitching, salivation, an occasional bit of light in my visual field. There was definitely no joy. Then, during one particular meditation, several flies started crawling on my face. They crawled over my lips, my eyelids, and even in and out of my nostrils. I was exerting a tremendous effort in the face of this immense distraction to keep the flies in peripheral awareness and my attention on the breath. Sometimes the flies would go away, but then they'd shortly return. I stayed in a heightened state of vigilance any time they were gone, because at any moment they could be back. It seemed to go on forever, but at some point the last fly left and didn't come back for a long time. Eventually, the thought arose that maybe they were gone for good. What a relief! I let go of all effort and just rested on the sensations of the breath. Immediately I felt joy spreading over me in waves, and then stabilizing. I realized that I didn't have to keep trying so hard. And in that moment I fully grasped the significance of letting go. In other words, prior to the flies, I had reached a point where effort was no longer needed, but I hadn't known it. So I didn't take that last step toward effortlessness. I've been grateful to those flies ever since. Continuing Obstacles to Effortlessness After that lesson, I still had trouble dropping effort and letting go. I realized that it's one thing to know you're capable of effortless focus, but it's something else entirely to let go of the effort. Letting go was still a challenge in subsequent sessions, and I couldn't repeat the experience at will. Then, even when I succeeded in suspending the effort, the waves of joy would end as soon as the urge to take control returned. Like many people, I had a deeply entrenched need to be in control, due to desire and fear. I needed to overcome this control issue before I could experience the joy of effortlessness with any consistency. The answer was, and still is, complete surrender. I had to simply stop caring whether it would happen or not, while at the same time totally trusting that it would. I had to let the practice happen without doing the practice. We're all different, and maybe you won't hold on so tightly. Yet keep in mind that even when you know it's safe to drop all effort, actually letting go can still be hard. Most of us have a lifetime habit of being in control of thinking we are a self who is an active agent responsible for making things happen. Don't try to make anything happen. Just trust in the process and let it unfold naturally. When you reach the end of Stage 7, there's enough unification to produce the effortlessness of mental pliancy, which always comes with some meditative joy. Joy seems to be the natural state of a unified mind. And the more unified a mind is, the more joyful it is. Joy is also the glue that helps keep a mind unified. However, you can count on desire and aversion, worry and remorse, ill will, impatience, fear, and doubt to eventually perturb the mind, erode unification, and shift the mind back into a state of inner conflict and dissatisfaction. Stage 8 is about conditioning the mind to sustain a high degree of unification even in the face of hindrances. Then meditative joy is fully developed, and the glue has set. Experiencing joy while breathing in, he trains himself. Experiencing joy while breathing out, he trains himself. Experiencing pleasure while breathing in, he trains himself. Experiencing pleasure while breathing out, he trains himself. Anapanasati Sutta. 
Conclusion You have mastered Stage 7 when you can consistently achieve effortlessness. The restless tendency of attention to follow objects in peripheral awareness has been tamed. When you first sit down, you still need to go through a settling-in process. You'll count your breaths, sharpen your attention and awareness, and diligently ignore everything until the mind is pacified and competing intentions disappear. Then you can let go and cruise. When you can consistently achieve effortlessness and stay there for all or most of the sit, you have become an adept practitioner. You have reached the third milestone achievement and are ready to move to the next stage. Seventh Interlude The Nature of Mind and Consciousness In this interlude, we examine the changes that occur as the mind grows more unified in the higher stages. We also provide a simple but profound revision to the mind system model to help you better understand and navigate the stages to come. Unification, Mindfulness, Purification, and Insight As you progress through the higher stages, the entire mind system continues to unify becoming ever more cohesive and harmonious, and ever less fragmented and conflicted. This process has three profound effects. Mindfulness keeps improving, as does the magic of mindfulness. Deep unconscious material rises to the surface, allowing for further purification, and profound insight becomes more likely. Why does the unification of mind produce such far-reaching consequences? The basic explanation is quite straightforward. More unification produces a larger consensus of sub-minds tuned into the information appearing in consciousness. At the end of the mind-system interlude, we posed the question, Who is conscious? The answer was the collective of minds that constitute the mind-system. However, just because information projected into consciousness becomes available to every sub-mind of the mind-system, that doesn't mean they all receive it. It's like a radio show. The show is being broadcast, but not everyone is tuning in to listen. So, too, in the non-unified mind, any information projected into consciousness rarely registers with more than a small fraction of sub-minds. Unification changes this by increasing the size of the receptive audience. This larger audience is tuned into the meditation object and to anything else that may appear in consciousness as well, including insight experiences. Increasing the Power of Mindfulness From Stage 7 on, the quality of mindfulness improves dramatically. You'll feel more fully present with whatever appears in consciousness, and the experience of knowing will have more power and richness. According to the moments of consciousness model, this just shouldn't happen. Most of your mind moments became perceiving moments in stage five. The proportion of perceiving to non-perceiving mind moments continued to increase through stages six and seven meaning the vividness and clarity of mindfulness improved as well. But past stage seven, you should have very few non-perceiving mind moments left, so any further increases in mindfulness should be minimal. By itself, the moments of consciousness model can't explain how mindfulness improves so much beyond stage seven. After all, once every mind moment becomes a perceiving moment, and dullness completely disappears, mindfulness shouldn't improve any further because the bandwidth of consciousness is full. However, when we combine the moments of consciousness model with the mind system model, we can easily see how mindfulness can keep increasing in power into stage eight and beyond. As more sub-minds unify around a particular conscious intention, the audience for the contents of consciousness grows larger. With greater unification, more sub-minds are tuning in to consciousness at any one time. In other words, our degree of mindfulness depends not only on the number of perceiving moments, but also on how much unification there is. 
This also helps us understand why a martial artist or an athlete in the zone can be totally alert, but still not have the mindfulness of an adept meditator. Only a limited number of sub-minds are involved in fighting an opponent or running for a touchdown. Rather than being unified, the rest of the sub-minds are just offline. When the fight is over or the athlete leaves the field, the cacophony of conflicting sub-minds resumes. At the adept level of practice, you'll also notice that mindfulness can still be quite powerful even when you're dull and can't think clearly because of fatigue or illness. Furthermore, you can sustain strong mindfulness even as you fall asleep at night, and lucid dreams aren't uncommon. Even in deep, dreamless sleep, we can have the experience of knowing we're asleep. Again, this contradicts what the Moments of Consciousness model predicts. If dullness is due to a decrease in perceiving moments, then mindfulness should erode when dullness sets in. Indeed, meditation would seem pointless when we're sick or sleepy. But with greater unification, even if there are fewer perceiving moments of consciousness, the content of those moments is reaching more sub-minds. That is, there is less information in consciousness, but a bigger audience watching. So not only can we practice when we're dull, but we should practice, because unification can continue even in dullness. Enhancing the Magic of Mindfulness Unifying the mind doesn't just enhance mindfulness. It also enhances the magic of mindfulness. In the second interlude, we talked about how the magic of mindfulness was its ability to reprogram old patterns of thought and behavior, transforming our personalities for the better. Such dramatic changes are possible because mindfulness provides new information to unconscious sub-minds so they can unlearn old, habitual ways of reacting. However, for this transformation to happen, the relevant sub-minds must receive the new information as it becomes available in consciousness. Unfortunately, the relevant sub-minds might not be tuned in to consciousness, resulting in missed opportunities for mindfulness to work its magic. As the mind grows unified, however, the audience for conscious experience expands, and the amount of assimilation and reprogramming increases proportionally, as do the positive results. Unification plays the same role in insight as it does in personality change. For an insight experience to actually reprogram our intuitive view of reality, the relevant information must reach a large enough audience of sub-minds. What makes a mere insight experience into a transformative insight is how many sub-minds of the mind system share in the experience. We can have a profound spiritual experience, yet the effects may be short-lived. There simply weren't enough sub-minds unified around the experience, tuned in to the information in consciousness, to produce a major transformation. Unification also affects how deeply insight penetrates. As the information provided by an insight experience sinks deeper and deeper into the unconscious mind, the insight matures. A weak insight becomes a powerful insight. The process by which insight deepens is the same in every case. New information gets assimilated by the sub-minds that are tuned in, forcing them to revise their reality constructs. At some point, the transformation created by insight becomes so widely established in the mind system that our worldview changes completely. That's why unifying the mind is so important for achieving insight. Further Purification of Mind as unification increased in stage seven, it created pressure on other unconscious sub-minds to join in the process. That's why you may have experienced another round of purification of mind. For sub-minds to unify, conflicting goals and priorities must first be resolved. Since conflict resolution and integration can only occur in consciousness, the effect of this pressure from below was to force the buried content, preventing unification up into consciousness to be purified. The exclusive focus and pacification of mind in stage seven created the perfect opportunity for both deeply buried and extremely subtle material to surface. This is the hidden story behind the subjective experience of purification. 
As we mentioned in the last interlude, purification is important for minimizing the psychological trauma that can accompany the insights leading up to awakening. Therefore, as we enter the adept stages with their greatly increased potential for insight, allowing purification to continue is more crucial than ever. How a Cessation Experience Becomes Transformative Insight The mind system model and unification process help us understand one of the most profound insight experiences, the cessation event. A cessation event is where unconscious sub-minds remain tuned in and receptive to the contents of consciousness, while at the same time none of them project any content into consciousness. Then consciousness ceases, completely. During that period, at the level of consciousness, there is a complete cessation of mental fabrications of any kind, of the illusory, mind-generated world that otherwise dominates every conscious moment. This, of course, also entails a complete cessation of craving, intention, and suffering. The only information that tuned-in sub-minds receive during this event is the fact of a total absence. What makes this the most powerful of all insight experiences is what happens in the last few moments of consciousness leading up to the cessation. First, an object arises in consciousness that would normally produce craving. It can be almost anything. However, what happens next is quite unusual. The mind doesn't respond with the habitual craving and clinging. Rather, it fully understands the object from the perspective of insight as a mental construct, completely empty of any real substance, impermanent, and a cause of suffering. This profound realization leads to the next and final moment of complete equanimity, in which the shared intention of all the unified sub-minds is to not respond. Because nothing is projected into consciousness, the cessation event arises. With cessation, the tuned-in sub-minds simultaneously realize that everything appearing in consciousness is simply the product of their own activity. In other words, they realize that the input they're accustomed to receiving is simply a result of their own fabricating activities. This has a dramatic effect. The sub-minds of the discriminating mind have the insight that everything ever known, including the self, was nothing but a fabrication of the mind itself. The sub-minds of the sensory mind have a slightly different insight. The only kind of information that ever appears in the mind that isn't purely mind-generated is the input coming to them directly from the sense organs. If the sub-minds are receptive, but there is nothing to receive, can a cessation event be consciously recalled afterward? It all depends on the nature of the shared intention before the cessation occurred. If the intention of all the tuned-in sub-minds was to observe objects of consciousness, as with popular noting practices, all that subsequently recalled is an absence, a gap. After all, if every object of consciousness ceases, and there's no intention for the sub-minds to observe anything else, then nothing gets imprinted in memory. However, if the intention was to be metacognitively aware of the state and activities of the mind, we would remember having been fully conscious, but not conscious of anything. We would recall having a pure consciousness experience, PCE, or an experience of consciousness without an object, CWO. To be clear, there is no actual experience of consciousness without an object during the cessation event, nor could there possibly be. This experience, like any other, is a construct of the mind and in this case is generated after the cessation event has already ended. How the memory of a cessation event is interpreted retrospectively takes many forms, depending on the views and beliefs held by the person whose mind is doing the interpreting. Thus, the cessation event itself is not a mental construct, but the subsequent interpretations are entirely constructed. Regardless of what does or doesn't imprint in memory, Every sub-mind tuned into consciousness during cessation must assimilate the event into its own representation of reality. 
As with any insight experience, the new information forces a reprogramming of how all future experiences are interpreted and responded to. Realizing that all phenomenal experiences, including the self, are mere mental constructs and therefore empty of any real substance, radically transforms how the mind functions. We understand more clearly than ever before craving and suffering as the grasping after mere mental constructs, and the more subminds are tuned in during the event, the stronger the understanding will be. Of course, it's not hard to acquire a conceptual grasp of these truths. Many have done so. But only insight can establish this understanding at a deep, intuitive level. The transformative power of a cessation event depends on how unified the mind was. Unification determines the overall size of the audience of sub-minds receptive to events in consciousness. Only the parts of the mind system that were tuned in during the cessation are affected. If the mind were completely unified, then every sub-mind within the mind system would be affected simultaneously, and there would be a complete awakening of the entire mind system. However, if the mind system was only partially unified, there are two possibilities. No transformation, or incomplete transformation. This is because a certain degree of unification is needed during the event to reach enough sub-minds to make any tangible, lasting difference to the whole mind system. With too little unification, a person may have a very memorable peak experience, but with little or no lasting effect. However, if the critical threshold is reached, the second possibility is an incomplete transformation of the mind system, limited to those sub-minds that happened to be tuned in at the time. Complete transformation must await subsequent cessations or other insight experiences that have a similar impact on the remaining parts of the mind system. This incremental process of transformation explains why awakening is traditionally described as occurring in a series of stages. Extending the Mind System Model The mind system model has great explanatory power. Yes, it's a simplification of a complex reality, but that's why it's so useful. We have pictured the mind system as consisting of the conscious mind surrounded by and connected to the unconscious, sensory, discriminating and narrating minds. The conscious mind is a locus where information exchange takes place, and consciousness refers specifically to the actual process of information exchange. Who is conscious is the collective of unconscious minds that exchange information in this way. But by revising the model just a little, we'll have an even better one that answers a number of questions the basic model can't easily explain. It will also help explain the subtleties of mind revealed in meditation and provide a useful framework for interpreting the practice instructions in the next stages. The revision is simple, but the implications are profound. The same basic structure of the mind system is repeated at many different levels. This means that each unconscious mind, communicating via the conscious mind, also consists of a collection of its own sub-minds. For instance, the auditory mind that sends information into consciousness also has a collection of connected sub-minds. These are responsible for a variety of processes such as pitch, intensity, duration, and so forth. Each of these sub-minds is in turn a collection of sub-sub-minds, and this structure keeps repeating itself down to the very simplest of mental processes. This also means there are multiple conscious mind-like loci where consciousness-like processes of information exchange occur at every level in the hierarchy. This repeated organizational structure, in which the exact same processes that produce consciousness happen at deeper and deeper levels, shows the fractal nature of the mind system. The only reason the particular information exchange process we call consciousness is special is because we experience it subjectively, and that subjective experience seems to be limited just to information exchange occurring at the highest level in the mind system. Likewise, there are narrating mind-like processes responsible for combining, organizing, and summarizing the information that appears.
Some part of the information in each exchange locus gets projected to the next, higher exchange locus, just as some of the contents of consciousness get projected into the world as speech or action. Sometimes the information is in its original form when it moves up to the next level. Often, though, it has been modified by condensing and combining it with other information. Therefore, what appears in consciousness as the content of a discrete moment of consciousness is really the output from many different unconscious sub-minds and sub-sub-minds, meaning it has already been extensively compiled and sorted. This revised model also gives us a better picture of how intention works. According to the mind system model, all intentions are generated in the unconscious mind. The role of consciousness is to allow, suppress, or modify these intentions before they produce an action. However, if the unconscious intentions rising into consciousness were always simple, conditioned reactions, similar situations would always generate the same intentions. But this isn't what happens. Also, new intentions arising into consciousness are often already quite complex. And that's because much of the evaluation, modification, and vetting of competing intentions has already occurred at an unconscious level. Finally, extending the mind-system model gives us a new perspective into the nature of all conscious experience. The content of consciousness is actually the output from many different sub-minds and sub-sub-minds. It consists largely of binding moments. All the individual bits of sensory information have already been extensively combined, analyzed, and interpreted before we ever become conscious of them. This means that our conscious experience of ourselves and the people, things, and events we know as reality is made up entirely of highly processed mental constructs. Information Processing in the Sensory Minds to gain a more complete picture of this upgraded mind-system model, let's look at the kind of information exchange that happens within the sensory mind as a whole. Information from all the different senses gets exchanged via a conscious mind-like, but still unconscious, information exchange locus. For example, auditory information can contribute to the processing of visual information, and vice versa, such as when its auditory mind can't recognize a sound, and the eyes search for its source. This also allows information from different senses to be bound together. Knowing which person is saying the words you hear is an example of this type of pre-conscious binding. Looking closer at individual sensory minds, each one is actually made up of a number of sub-minds. The visual mind, for example, is comprised of many different visual sub-minds, each processing different kinds of information coming from the eyes, color, brightness, contrast, lines, shape, motion, etc. These visual sub-minds communicate with each other by projecting information into a conscious mind-like location. Then all the other visual sub-minds have access to the information and can incorporate it into their own processing activities. This process of information exchange within sub-minds is exactly like what we call consciousness at the highest level of the mind system. But because it happens at a deeper level, it can never be part of our conscious experience. If we could somehow look inside the sub-minds of one of these sensory minds, say the visual mind, we would find that it doesn't process visual information as images, or even as sense percepts like contrast, color, and shape. It only converts that information into sense percepts or images at the highest level, before exchanging it with other parts of the mind system. As an analogy, consider computers. Images serve no purpose within computers. Rather, all input must first be converted into ones and zeros before the computer can use it. Then your computer converts the results of its processing activities from ones and zeros into an image on your monitor so it's meaningful to you. Otherwise, the information within a particular sensory mind appears as something just as unintelligible as ones and zeros. But between sensory minds, information is communicated in the form of sense percepts like color, warmth, and sounds that are meaningful to the entire mind system. Sense percepts are the lingua franca of the mind system. 
Inside every sensory mind, there is also a sub-mind that binds sense percept together. In the visual mind, information from many different visual sub-minds is integrated into a recognizable image. These highly composite images are what ordinarily get projected into consciousness. In other words, what we become conscious of are mostly binding moments of consciousness, each containing a filtered, pre-sorted, and pre-assembled synopsis of the vast amount of information continuously flowing into the brain from the eyes. The cost associated with all this integration is a huge loss of information at every level of binding, which reaches colossal proportions by the time it reaches consciousness. However, a certain amount of detail is restored to perceptual experience because some simple, unbound sense percepts, like color and contrast, get projected directly into consciousness, interspersed among the binding moments. This is precisely what gives normal visual experience its richness and texture. Normal sensory perception consists of a mix of discrete moments of consciousness, reflecting many different levels of information processing in the sensory mind. There are the simple, unbounded sense percepts, like color, temperature, pressure, and pitch. Then there are the binding moments that combine sensory percepts. Contrast, brightness, color, and shape are combined to create an image. Pitch, loudness, timbre, and sustain are united to make a musical phrase. The normal tactile experience of the breath is another example, consisting of a multi-level integration of touch, pressure, movement, temperature, and so on. Finally, there is the higher-level unconscious binding activity that combines information from the different senses. Drugs and certain kinds of brain injuries produce bizarre sensory effects, by altering the mix of bound and unbound sensory information reaching consciousness. Something similar also happens when we see or hear something we can't recognize because the sensory mind can't make sense of the information it receives. We can feel our whole mind struggling to make something meaningful from them as different components of sensation appear in consciousness. Information Processing in the Discriminating Mind the conscious mind is where the sensory, thinking, emotional, and narrating minds exchange information. When projected into consciousness, the content of all the various sensory mind moments becomes available to the discriminating mind. The thinking, emotional mind then conceptually identifies and evaluates that information before adding it back into the stream of conscious moments. The conceptual and emotional output of the thinking, emotional mind then becomes available to the sensory and narrating minds. The narrating mind performs the highest level of information binding within the mind system as a whole. Attention and awareness each have their role in this information processing. Attention extracts specific parts from the vast amount of information contained in these moments of consciousness for more processing. Most of the time, attention selects, processes, and re-projects complex, high-level binding moments. These are the high-level moments that get bound together by the narrating mind. The function of awareness, on the other hand, is to selectively deliver to consciousness whatever attention requests for analysis. Although conscious experience is dominated by perceptions derived from high-level binding moments and narrative moments of consciousness, its richness comes from individual sense percepts and lower-level binding moments. This richness increases proportionately when the content of consciousness shifts toward more low-level information processing and away from complex binding, abstract thinking, and storytelling. The increased richness and detail that comes with being more fully present is an example of such a shift. Applying the Revised Model to Meditation Experiences With stable attention and powerful mindfulness, we can witness events in the mind system that simply aren't accessible to the untrained mind. This is because intentionally directed and effortlessly sustained attention has a powerful effect on what appears in peripheral awareness. When we choose to attend to certain kinds of mind moments and ignore others, those moments become much more apparent because they increase in frequency, while the others decrease. In particular, when we preferentially attend to lower-level binding moments 
and basic sense percepts. It narrows the overall range of mind moments, making these stand out much more prominently. Thus, sustained selective attention can give us access to the many different levels at which raw sensory data gets converted into our familiar conscious experience. The exceptional power of awareness and attention then allows us to observe these different levels of information processing with great clarity. Take the example of the acquired appearance of the meditation object at stage six, when conceptual interpretations of the breath fell away. This was the first time you became so fully and continuously conscious of individual sense percept. Prior to this stage, they were fewer and scattered among a large number of more complex binding moments, such as those producing recognizable experiences, such as in-breath. But as attention focused more on the sensations of the breath, the mind system responded by providing more mind moments involving simple sense percepts. At the same time, conceptual and other more complex binding moments arising in awareness were consistently ignored, so higher-level binding moments decreased. As the proportion of simple sense percepts increased in both attention and peripheral awareness, perception shifted to become more direct and less conceptual, and you experienced individual sense percepts directly. The well-trained mind of an adept can witness processes and events at an even more subtle level. If you did the practice of close following, described in Stage 7, you may have experienced sensory information before it was converted into a sense percept. This type of close, fine-grained observation is not available to ordinary consciousness. That kind of raw, unprocessed sensory data appeared as a vibratory flux empty of meaning. Not only is information in that form unrecognizable, but the mind system as a whole tends to recoil from the experience in great discomfort. This practice pushes the tactile sensory mind to project information into consciousness in a form usually exchanged only between tactile sub-minds. Like the ones and zeros of a computer, this information is meaningless outside of that particular sensory mind. This type of information never becomes conscious except as part of rare drug experiences, or brain injury, or in meditation. As you move into stage eight and beyond, you will engage in practices that allow you to further examine other subtle mental processes. For instance, in the meditation on dependent arising in stage eight, you will investigate fleeting thoughts and sensations. You will realize these are binding moments of consciousness, and the aim of the practice is to unbind them, so to speak. You will deconstruct these sensations and thoughts to become aware of the feelings, cravings, and intentions that were bound together with the thought or sensation in the unconscious. In later stages, you will also start to realize how our sense of time and space are the result of unconscious binding activities. Consider time. Our ordinary sense of events happening in time appears immediate. We watch as events unfold. But think about all the different sensory sub-minds at work that have to organize, store, and integrate this information before it becomes conscious. Each sense percept that appears in an unconscious information exchange locus quickly passes away to be replaced by another. To become meaningful, a series of individual sense percepts must be stored, and when enough have accumulated for a pattern to emerge, they are bound together in a way that reflects their relationship over time. This temporal binding is a fundamental kind of binding that necessarily precedes most other kinds. What we actually experience in consciousness, therefore, are binding moments with the sense of time already embedded in each moment. In more everyday terms, what we experience as real time is actually after the fact. Time is, in a sense, packaged into mind moments by the unconscious sub-minds to be unpacked later in consciousness. Temporal binding moments are always being projected into consciousness, but can only be clearly discerned once most other binding moments have been excluded. For example, during the early part of close-following meditation in Stage 7, 
You experienced the breath as jerky pulses of sensations. Those pulses are instances of what temporal binding moments look like in relative isolation. The idea of your experience of time as a mental construct may initially seem foreign, but you will gain first-hand experience as you progress further. By the time you reach stage 10, you may be able to experience temporally extended events as a whole, without the time element being fully unpacked. This preconceptual, temporally bound sensory information can also be used as a meditation object to enter very deep jhanas. Spatial binding is another fundamental form of information binding. Visual percepts and sounds, for example, are located on an internal mental map of surrounding space, with our body in the center. In the same way, tactile percepts are associated with specific locations on an internal map of the body. Spatial binding is so ubiquitous that we usually become aware of it only by its absence. You may have already experienced one example of this in stage six, when the breath seemed to appear disconnected from the nose. This dislocation happens when breath sense percepts become divorced from our internal map of the body. All such meditation experiences clearly demonstrate that our sense of space results from unconscious sub-minds organizing, integrating, and projecting binding moments into consciousness. These are just a few examples of the different unconscious processes contributing to conscious experience that can be revealed through meditation. As you proceed, you may also experience how temporally and spatially bound sense percepts from different senses get combined together in the unconscious. Another possibility is seeing how bound collections of sense percepts arrive in consciousness already recognized and labeled. These are further integrated with other stored concepts, allowing their potential significance to be evaluated. Then, still more conceptual binding gives rise to desire, aversion, loving-kindness, compassion, and other forms of intention. From these, in turn, flow the even more complex conceptual formations that produce actions and reactions. Any or all of these phenomena, and a variety of others not mentioned here, may be revealed in meditation. The Nature of Consciousness To make the mind-system model even more accurate, we need to make one last change. The particular information exchange locus we have been calling the conscious mind is not a place or a locus after all. The information exchange process we call consciousness doesn't actually happen in a particular part of the brain, nor is it even a specific function of the brain. That was just a convenient way for us to talk about it. Consciousness is simply the fact of information exchange, and refers specifically to information exchange occurring at the highest levels in the mind system. But information exchange happens at every other level in the mind system, too. Information exchange anywhere, in any form, is the result of shared receptivity, and shared receptivity is an expression of interconnectedness, Put another way, consciousness is simply the inevitable result of the interconnectedness of different parts of the brain, and of the shared receptivity that results in information exchange between them. The radical interconnectedness of the brain is what makes it so unique and powerful. It has been estimated that there are more possible connections in a single human brain than there are particles of matter in the entire universe. This means that vast amounts of information exchange are occurring at absolutely every level within the brain and nervous system, in every moment. Each and every neural circuit in the brain, even if it is the simplest of reflexes consisting of only two linked neurons, has the property of shared receptivity. The output of one neuron becomes input for all of the other neurons in the circuit, Individual neural circuits are linked together in the brain to produce more complex circuits. More complex circuits are linked together to form functional systems within the brain, and these systems are likewise linked into larger systems. The highest level information exchange process, the one that we experience subjectively and call consciousness, 
is no different from what is happening at every other level in the brain-mind system. But we are not simply reducing the mind to the brain, nor consciousness to something the brain does. If we think about the implications of consciousness being the result of shared receptivity and information exchange, it takes us in a completely different direction than reductionism. Consider the fact that shared receptivity and information exchange doesn't stop at the level of neurons in the brain. A single neuron is a system of interacting organelles, the specialized structures that make up a cell. Organelles are systems formed by interacting molecules, which are themselves composed of interacting atoms. Atoms are systems formed by the interactions of even subtler forms of matter and energy. Each of these structures, person, brain systems and circuits, cells, molecules, atoms, and so forth, is a natural individual. A natural individual is an entity defined by the shared receptivity and consequent exchange of information between its component parts. This means that every molecule and every person is a kind of unique individual, but it's our interconnectedness rather than an external boundary that gives us our individuality. This also implies that the process of information exchange called consciousness at the level of a person is no different from what is happening at all these other levels as well. Shared receptivity and information exchange doesn't stop at the level of individual human consciousness, either. People are interconnected in the form of many different kinds of social units, from couples and families to nations and humankind as a whole. We view these organizations of people as distinct entities and often speak of them as having a kind of group consciousness. Even the United States Supreme Court has intuited a sort of personhood in corporations. It is, of course, a politically and legally problematic comparison, simply because corporations have so much more power than an individual person. Nevertheless, corporations, churches, and political parties all take part in information exchange and thus have a type of consciousness one step above that of individual persons. Pursuing this idea even further, multiple species are interconnected to form ecosystems. Ecosystems are interconnected to form biomes, and the biosphere is formed of interconnected biomes. Both the living and non-living parts of planet Earth interact changing each other to form a single, complex, interdependent system. Planets and stars form galactic and supragalactic systems. It's not unreasonable to view the entire universe as one single, massively interconnected and interdependent system. Indeed, every structure we have identified, from atoms to persons to the universe as a whole, constitutes a natural individual by virtue of shared receptivity and information exchange. From this perspective, what we call consciousness is just a single, limited example of something that pervades the entire universe at every level. Stage 8. Mental Pliancy and Pacifying the Senses 8. The goal of stage eight is simple pacification of the senses and the full arising of meditative joy. Simply continue to practice using skills that are now completely effortless. Effortlessly sustained exclusive attention will produce mental and physical pliancy, pleasure, and joy. Practice Goals for Stage Eight You begin stage eight as an adept practitioner. You can consistently pacify the discriminating mind and enter a state of mental pliancy. In other words, you have effortlessly stable attention and powerful mindfulness. Each sit, it can take a while to reach effortlessness, and sometimes you'll stay at stage six or seven the whole time. But you should be able to reach mental pliancy fairly regularly and remain there for the rest of the sit. Much of the practice at this stage simply involves exercising your newly compliant mind's abilities to explore. You have two goals for this stage. As an adept meditator, with a highly compliant mind due to a complete pacification in stage seven, your first goal is to exercise this mind 
explore its nature, and discover and develop its inherent abilities. Think of your mind as an unknown territory where no one else has been and no one but you can go. A spiritual teacher can point you in certain directions, make suggestions based on his or her own experience, and offer valuable methods developed by other meditators in the past. After all, one human mind isn't so different from another, but it's your own needs and interests that will determine how you actually proceed. Follow wherever they take you. I promise you will go places and do things with your mind that are pointless to describe or discuss with anyone who hasn't made this journey on his or her own. The second major goal is complete pacification of the senses, which produces physical pliancy and fully developed meditative joy. Since both pacification of the senses and meditative joy result from the same unification process, we treat them as two parts of a single goal. To pacify the senses, you will exclude all sense objects from attention while sustaining metacognitive awareness. To cultivate meditative joy, you don't need to do anything different or special. Just keep practicing. It will arise naturally once the sensory minds grow quiet and the mind as a whole becomes sufficiently unified. You've mastered stage eight, when your eyes perceive only an inner light, your ears perceive only an inner sound, your body is suffused with pleasure and comfort, and your mental state is one of intense joy. Exercising the Newly Compliant Mind Your first goal is to exercise the skills you've already mastered in order to explore the nature of the mind and fully develop its inherent abilities. Mental pliancy gives you effortlessly stable attention and sustained powerful mindfulness, particularly in the form of metacognitive introspective awareness. The practices in the next section will help you experiment with attention. Those in the following section will enhance your metacognitive awareness. When to do which practices? You've probably already experienced some unusual sensory events, bodily movements, energy currents, or even joy, corresponding to the various grades of PT. Expect these to intensify through stage eight until you achieve pacification of the senses and meditative joy. During the first part of this stage, when you're experiencing grades 1 through 3 PD, do the practices described in this section, exercising the newly compliant mind. Toward the end of stage 8, when grade 4 PD starts to dominate, switch to the practices in the section Pacification of the Senses and Meditative Joy. Practices for Experimenting with Attention The effortlessness of mental pliancy comes with a distinct feeling of power and control over the mind. The power and control are real, even if the sense of a self who's in control is only an illusion. You may not yet realize the full extent of your abilities. You can focus your attention wherever you want, with whatever size scope you want, and for as long or as briefly as you choose. While sustained exclusive attention played a crucial role in developing your concentration and will continue to be useful to you as an adept, it's no longer a requirement. You can now freely shift your focus of attention from one mental or sensory object to another, as quickly or slowly as you like, and as often as you like, without losing stability. You'll soon discover you no longer need a specific focus of attention at all. Attention can rest in a state of openness, as you simply allow objects to arise and pass away without being captured by any of them. Here are two structured practices for you to try. These are particularly useful for the early part of Stage 8, where you're exploring and developing the capabilities of your mind. However, they'll remain useful long after you've moved beyond this stage. Momentary Concentration This practice involves momentarily shifting your focus of attention to various objects in peripheral awareness. Even though awareness is relatively free of mental objects like thoughts and images, sensations are still prominent. These include both ordinary and mind-generated sensations, energy movements, and actual bodily movements. 
You are also introspectively aware of feelings of pleasure or displeasure, desire or aversion, patience or impatience, curiosity, and so forth. Any of these can become a momentary object of concentration. Your attention is now so stable you can quickly and easily shift your focus from one object to another, maintaining exclusive focus with each. Start by choosing a sensation in peripheral awareness. Any distinct sensation will do. Shift your attention to it, making it the exclusive focus of attention for a moment. Let the breath sensation slip into peripheral awareness or disappear entirely. When the sensory object passes away, attention will automatically return to the breath. Then select another sensation for momentary attention. At first, only practice momentary attention with physical sensations or the mind-generated sensations that arise due to pacification. Once you're confident you can do this without losing exclusive attention or metacognitive awareness, try switching to mental objects like affective reactions and emotions, such as pleasure from hearing birds outside the window or annoyance at an itch. You can even allow individual thoughts or memories to arise holding them briefly as your object of attention while introspectively observing the mind's reactions to them. Another way to practice momentary concentration is by exploring objects using alternating attention while keeping your primary focus on the breath. Of course, alternating attention is also a form of momentary attention, one where the movements of attention are very fast. It's always been functionally important for the untrained mind in everyday experience. Now, with mental pliancy, alternating attention also becomes a useful tool in meditation. Start by forming the intention for attention to include something you've selected from peripheral awareness. You'll immediately have the familiar experience of attention alternating between the breath and the other object you've chosen. Let your attention keep alternating between the breath and various objects appearing in peripheral awareness, but make sure the primary object is always the breath. Earlier, we would have called these objects subtle distractions because your attention alternated to them spontaneously. Now, however, these movements of attention are fully intentional and effortlessly controlled. Next, experiment with redistributing your alternating attention increasing the ratio between moments of attention to the other object and to the breath. In other words, the breath will shift from being the primary object, moving into the background while the chosen object comes to occupy the main focus of attention. This is exactly the same experience we called gross distraction when it happened involuntarily, but it's now entirely intentional. Explore how attention alternates and the type of information this provides, then consider ways you can use this to learn more about yourself and how your mind works. Meditating on Arising and Passing Away In this practice, you closely investigate the arising and passing away of various phenomena with attention. While practicing momentary concentration, you probably already noticed how particular sensations or affective reactions arise, then quickly pass away often to be immediately replaced by a new but closely related object. For example, if the object is an ongoing sound, you will find it actually consists of a series of separate sounds arising and passing away one after another. If it's a single brief noise, you'll notice that even after the actual sound is stopped, it continues to reverberate in the mind. If it's an emotion or mental state, you'll notice that it's actually made of a series of closely related but different mental states, arising and passing in waves. Other times, the new object will be something quite different, but you'll notice there's a causal relationship between it and the last object to pass away. For example, if someone sneezes, as the sound disappears, it may be immediately followed by an image of a person sneezing. When that image passes, it might be replaced by a thought about catching a cold. You can make any of these objects your focus of attention. Because of mental pliancy, whenever the causal sequence comes to an end, your attention will always return to the breath, instead of being captured by something new. 
It's as though attention were tied to the breath by an elastic band that always pulls it right back. You may have noticed before how phenomena arise and pass away, but the swiftness of your mind and the clarity of your perception now exceed anything you've experienced before. The power and control you have while doing this are very satisfying and quickly take on the qualities of flow, much like what you experienced with the whole-body jhanas in stage six. Although jhana-like, this flow state is not jhana. The main differences are that you have complete intentional control in every moment, which you don't have in jhana, and the objects of attention are constantly changing. It's not unusual to experience grades three and four PT while doing this practice. Don't get attached to these experiences. Just keep practicing as before, allowing pacification and joy to develop naturally on their own. Exercising the Compliant Mind and Complete Pacification of the Senses When pacifying the senses, you're supposed to ignore sensations vying for attention— However, in the practices for exercising the compliant mind, you often focus attention on both ordinary and mind-generated sensations. So, aren't these two practices working against each other? There really isn't any conflict. Even though you're focusing attention on sense objects that you would otherwise ignore, the nature of the object of attention isn't important. What really matters is that there's a consensus of many sub-minds to attend to that one thing and ignore everything else. The same principle applies to the practices of momentary attention and choiceless attention, where attention is no longer exclusively focused on a single object. Even though attention is moving, the objects of attention are determined by a strong consensus of unified sub-minds to the exclusion of anything else so the result is effectively the same as exclusive attention. If the consensus is strong enough and involves enough sub-minds to produce the effortlessness of mental pliancy, then unification and pacification will continue. If not, the consensus won't be strong enough to stop attention from moving spontaneously to other sensations, and pacification will stall. Therefore, resist the temptation to engage in these practices before you're ready. Practices to Enhance Metacognitive Awareness Reflect for a moment on the duality between consciousness and the object of consciousness, between the act of knowing and what's known, between the cognizing and the cognized. Attention emphasizes the latter half of this duality, that is, the object of consciousness. Specifically, attention itself creates this polarization of knower and known, then focuses on the known. In the next practices, the emphasis shifts away from the object toward the act of knowing. This means a shift away from attention toward greater metacognitive awareness. Where this ultimately leads, though not immediately, is to a direct experience of the illuminating function of consciousness, the discerning cognition, that gives rise to the experience of a known object. From now on, no matter how you use attention, hold the intention for peripheral awareness to become more and more metacognitive, working toward a complete and continuous observation of the activities and state of the mind itself. You don't exclude extrospective content from peripheral awareness or attention. Rather, to whatever extent extrospective sensations are present, they're experienced as part of the activity occurring in the mind, rather than as objects in and of themselves. For example, in the hearing of a sound, the primary object of your observation isn't the sound that's being heard, but the mental act of hearing. This is also true for mental objects. Remain metacognitively aware of them as content of field of conscious awareness, but with the objects themselves being secondary. It's as much about how you know as it is what you know. The next two practices will help you develop and strengthen metacognitive awareness. They can be used for many other purposes in the future as well. Choiceless Attention Recall that some objects arrive in awareness with the intention that they will also become objects of attention. 
The practice of choiceless attention involves allowing attention to move freely in pursuit of the objects that arrive with the strongest intention to become objects of attention. In terms of the mind system model, choiceless attention is not truly choiceless. Rather, a powerful consensus of unified sub-minds has chosen to allow such objects to become the focus of attention. Monitoring this free movement of attention with metacognitive introspective awareness is an effective exercise for making this awareness more powerful. This practice is similar to momentary concentration, except that now you're allowing objects of attention to self-select. Subjectively, you experience attention freely and spontaneously striking or falling on certain objects one after the other as they arrive in the field of conscious awareness. This is just like the spontaneous movements of attention in an untrained mind, except now attention never becomes so engrossed as to be captured. Each brief period of intense focus is followed by attention quickly moving to something else. Furthermore, since the discriminating mind is pacified and there's mental pliancy, mental objects don't predominate as they normally would. Most important, however, is the strong, continuous, metacognitive quality of awareness present as the objects of attention constantly change. This makes the whole experience into one of observing the mind itself as an ongoing process, rather than merely experiencing the contents of attention as they arise and pass away. Of course, this exercise relates directly to the practice of mindfulness in daily life, where attention also moves freely. Now it will be easier throughout the day to maintain a mindfulness that takes the form of knowing the bigger picture of what the mind is doing and why. As with the meditation on arising and passing away, you may find yourself entering a flow state accompanied by grades 3 and 4 PT, consisting of incomplete pacification of the senses. This shows that the mind is continuing to unify as you engage in these practices. Meditation on Dependent Arising As metacognitive awareness grows stronger, the causal relationships between various sensory and mental events become clearer. This happens because one of the basic functions of peripheral awareness is to perceive the relationships of objects to each other and to the whole. In this meditation, you follow mental events as they occur in sequence. Specifically, consciousness of a sensation or thought, contact, is followed by an affective response, feeling, leading to desire or aversion, craving, then to the arising of an intention to act, becoming, and finally, to the action itself, birth. This is also called following the links of dependent arising, the causal relationship between mental processes described in traditional Buddhist literature. By intentionally tracking these causal links with attention, meditation on dependent arising makes metacognitive awareness more powerful and provides insight into how mental processes unfold. Let's say your ears are producing a buzzing sound. You can direct your attention toward that auditory sensation and observe the associated feeling of displeasure that arises. Then you notice that a desire for the sound to go away arises in response to the unpleasantness. But, because you're sitting in meditation, the only option for escape is to direct attention elsewhere. So you observe that an intention to redirect arises. Regardless of whether you act on that intention or not, a new contact event will follow. If attention doesn't move, this whole sequence will repeat, cycling through contact, feeling, craving, intention, and action as part of the ongoing experience of the sound. This will continue until contact of a different sort spontaneously intervenes or attention finally does move. For a more complex example involving thought, let's say your attention falls on the sensation of an energy movement in the body. It's accompanied by a feeling of unpleasantness, 
which becomes the next object of attention. This is followed immediately by a sense of aversion toward which attention now turns. Aversion triggers an unconscious thought, produced by one of the discriminating sub-minds, which then appears in peripheral awareness with a strong intention to become an object of attention. Attention notes this intention. The action that ensues is a shift of attention to the thought. Now the cycle repeats, this time with the thought as the initial object of attention. It may be a thought about the inner winds, or prana, and because this is an interesting topic, you observe how the thoughts elicit a positive feeling of pleasure. Following this, you may detect the desire to allow this train of thought to continue. This whole process crystallizes into an intention to continue pursuing the next associated thought, and so on. With practice, you can follow this unfolding elaboration of thought without losing your metacognitive perspective. You can just sit back and allow the next thought to appear, following its own sequence of dependent arising. Whether you're investigating thoughts or sensations, analysis is not the point. The content of the thoughts and sensations is mostly unimportant. You're just aware of how they arise and pass away in dependence on each other, and how they're linked together by feelings, cravings, intentions, and actions. As with choiceless attention, this meditation practice strongly exercises metacognitive awareness. Here, however, there is a more specific goal to acquire an intuitive understanding of the causal processes that drive our ongoing mental activities and which lead us to act and react as we do. If we bring our understanding of how these chains of association work into daily life, we're less likely to react out of aversion or craving and more likely to act from a place of wisdom. The meditation on dependent arising can have a powerful transformative effect especially when combined with the practice of mindful review. Unifying the mind, pacifying the senses, and the arising of meditative joy. The second major goal of this stage is the complete pacification of the senses, accompanied by the full arising of meditative joy. Both pacification and joy are different aspects of the same unification process, Pacification and joy are what we experience subjectively, whereas unification describes what happens at the unconscious level. Unification of mind really refers to unification of unconscious sub-minds, and there are degrees of unification, depending on the extent of their cooperation. The degree of unification determines how much pacification and joy we experience consciously. Because there is very little unification in the ordinary mind, attention shifts and vacillates, divided in its purposes. Exclusive attention requires more unification, but only of the unconscious sub-minds currently interacting via consciousness, typically just a very small part of the unconscious mind. Pacification of the discriminating mind develops as more and more sub-minds of the discriminating mind grow unified around the intention to maintain exclusive attention. When there was enough unification, you experienced the effortlessly stable attention of mental pliancy. Complete pacification of the senses happens the same way. When unconscious sensory sub-minds become unified around the conscious intention to attend exclusively to the chosen object, they refrain from doing anything that disrupts exclusive attention. With enough unification of the sensory sub-minds, normal sensory information is no longer projected into consciousness, and when there's enough unification for complete sensory pacification, the mental state of meditative joy begins to arise as well. As discussed in the sixth interlude, you'll encounter various unusual sensations as part of pacification of the senses before achieving physical pliancy. You will also experience energy currents, involuntary movements, and other unusual autonomic effects before the full development of meditative joy. All these sensory events and movements happen at the same time 
and intermingle. For sake of clarity, however, we first describe what accompanies pacifying the senses, and then we discuss what accompanies meditative joy. Pacifying the Senses Complete pacification of the senses means normal sensory information no longer gets projected into consciousness because the sensory sub-minds have grown temporarily quiescent. Just as complete pacification of the discriminating mind results in mental pliancy, full pacification of the senses results in physical pliancy. With physical pliancy, you can sit comfortably for long periods without discomfort or any sensory distractions. Physical pliancy is accompanied by the bliss of physical pliancy, a wonderfully pleasant sensation pervading the entire body. Even with pacification, the sense organs keep functioning normally. The ear still registers sounds, for example. That sound is also processed by the auditory sub-mind, but it's not projected into consciousness. Any sensation that the unconscious sub-minds identify as unimportant, such as another meditator coughing, a door closing, or a dog barking, doesn't enter consciousness. The same is true for all the other senses. Sensory information still registers in the respective sensory sub-minds, but it's processed only to the point of simple recognition. All this sensory information is still available if and when we want it, but it doesn't appear in consciousness until we intentionally call it up. Although ordinary sensations disappear from awareness, some purely mind-generated sensations persist, including an inner illumination, unusual bodily perceptions, and internal sounds. However, exceptionally strong, unusual, or especially significant sensory inputs, are still projected into consciousness. Yet with pacification, they enter consciousness in a way that doesn't disturb our meditation, unless their presence elicits a conscious, intentional response. For example, the ringing of a telephone may enter consciousness, but the mind system as a whole can choose to respond or not. If a fly lands on your face, you can know it's there without any annoyance or concern. And when you recognize the sound of the bell signaling the end of your meditation, the focus on the meditation object dissolves because of a pre-existing intention to respond this way. The sensory pacification happens for two reasons. First, when you exercise exclusive attention, you completely ignore sensations that arise in peripheral awareness. This deprives them of the attentional energy needed to sustain them, so they fade away. Second, when you cultivate metacognitive introspective awareness, you do so at the expense of ordinary extrospective awareness. That is, by turning awareness inward, you deny awareness to normal external sensory input. The combination of these two activities eventually causes the sensory minds to stop projecting ordinary sensations into peripheral awareness altogether. Therefore, all you have to do is keep exercising exclusive attention and cultivating metacognitive awareness, using the practices for exercising the newly compliant mind until the senses are fully pacified. There is only one major obstacle that you must first overcome, unusual mind-generated sensations. Unusual Sensations Before they're unified enough, the sensory minds react strongly to being ignored. They start projecting lights, sounds, and all sorts of strange and sometimes unpleasant bodily sensations into consciousness that have nothing to do with anything happening externally. These mind-generated sensory phenomena tend to dominate this stage. They can be quite disturbing, as well as distracting, since they're so unusual. It's almost as if the sensory minds resist being ignored like stubborn children. Their whole purpose seems to be to capture your attention and arouse your interest. Interestingly, though, the more they do this, the less they project immediate, real-time sensory information into peripheral awareness. This shows that the process of pacification is actually underway. 
When these phenomena consistently take the form of grade 3 PT, it means you've reached the final phase of pacifying the senses, and the time has come to ignore them completely. The early part of Stage 8 provided plenty of opportunity to explore these phenomena and observe your mind's reaction to them using the practices described in the previous section. This didn't interfere with the ongoing pacification process and hopefully satisfied your curiosity, making it easier to ignore them now and achieve complete pacification. Once pacification is complete, you'll experience Grade 4 pity. Mind-generated sound and light may continue, but ordinary sensations completely disappear, and the chills, hot flashes, pressure, itching, pinpricks, tingling, and so forth are replaced by the bliss of physical pliancy. Meditative Joy As your practice progresses and the mind keeps unifying, meditative joy will naturally arise. This type of joy is a unique mental state that only arises in meditation. To understand it better, let's briefly look at how it compares to joy in general. Although we tend to think of joy as a simple emotional experience, it's actually a comprehensive mental state. This is true of emotions in general. They are functional states of mind. This means they cause the mind to behave or function in very specific ways. They influence what we attend to, how we perceive what we attend to, and the feelings generated in response to what we perceive, all of which exerts a powerful influence over our thoughts, speech, and actions. Joy is also a functioning state that evokes a specific pattern of mental behavior affecting attention, perception, and feelings. First, it predisposes us to notice and preferentially attend to what is beautiful, wholesome, pleasant, and satisfying. At the same time, things that are ugly, unwholesome, or unpleasant tend not to draw or hold attention. Second, the perceptions arising in a joyful mind, no matter what we happen to attend to, always emphasize the positive aspects. The glass will be perceived as half full rather than as half empty, and neither full nor empty. Finally, joy causes our feelings about everything to shift toward the positive end of the spectrum. Something ordinarily experienced as mildly pleasant becomes extremely pleasant. Something neutral, like the simple act of breathing, arouses feelings of pleasure. What would otherwise be mildly unpleasant is experienced as neutral, and what would ordinarily be quite unpleasant is only mildly so. By skewing conscious experience in this way, joy tends to be a stable, self-sustaining state, selectively attending to the pleasant and preferentially perceiving the good in every situation helps avoid experiences that perturb the state of joy. In other words, the positive effect produced by joy encourages a favorable reinterpretation of conscious experiences that threaten to undermine joy, further adding to its resilience. As pointed out in the sixth interlude, the mental state of sadness or grief is the exact opposite of joy. Sadness orients attention to what is unwholesome, ugly, and dissatisfying. Our perceptions emphasize the problematic aspects of whatever we attend to, and our affective reactions are skewed toward displeasure. Thoughts tend to be pessimistic and cynical, and simply being alive can seem painful. To really grasp the nature of joy, picture a child who has just been told they're going to get something they've wanted for a long time. On hearing the news, they become joyful, excited, and happy, even though they haven't received it yet. The only change is cognitive, but it has put them in the positive mental state of joy. This state will influence the child's perceptions and reactions to whatever happens for as long as it lasts, perhaps hours. For another example, consider when a young person discovers his or her romantic feelings are reciprocated. They feel joyful exhilarated and happy. Life's problems seem to fade, and the world is seen through rose-colored glasses. A lover's mind is oriented toward the positive, 
preferentially sees beauty and goodness, and ignores or looks right through the negative and unpleasant. As in these examples, joy has an energetic, excited, even agitated quality. It's often accompanied by tingling sensations, flushing skin, bouncy, spontaneous body movements, goosebumps, chills running up and down the spine, and enthusiastic verbal expressions. Whenever there's a state of joy, there's also a feeling of happiness. But the two aren't the same. Happiness is not an emotional state, but a specific feeling, the feeling of mental pleasure. Happiness is a component of any pleasurable emotional state, but you can also have happiness by itself. Note that the mental pleasure produced by joy is independent of physical pleasure. The feeling of happiness that joy brings can coexist with and even allow us to ignore physical pain. Joy causes happiness and increases bodily pleasure. In turn, any pleasant experience, mental or physical, can contribute to the arising of joy. There is a reciprocal causality operating here that, beginning on either side, can create a self-sustaining positive feedback loop. As long as we keep attending to the pleasurable and ignoring the unpleasant, the state of joy will be sustained, at least until something interrupts this feedback cycle. Joy seems to be the default state of a unified mind. With ordinary joy, the immediate trigger is the prospect of fulfilling some worldly desire, and the sub-minds of the mind system unify around that desire. In the previous examples, the child and lover become happy because they are going to get what they want. Happiness brings about a temporary unification of sub-minds, which are all in agreement about the object of desire, and this leads to a joyful state of mind. But meditative joy differs significantly from ordinary joy. Unification in meditation is due to mental training, rather than gaining some desired object. It also comes from resolving inner conflicts through purification and mindfulness. As unification proceeds, conflict between sub-minds ends, and the usual state of inner struggle ceases. Then, once the mind is sufficiently unified, meditative joy arises spontaneously. As with regular joy, meditative joy generates happiness, referred to as the bliss of mental pliancy. However, we don't have to wait for meditative joy to arise spontaneously via unification. We can actually make it arise earlier. For example, we can use the feelings of satisfaction and happiness that come with your success in meditation to trigger it. This, in turn, can help speed up the unification process, because by intentionally cultivating meditative joy, you invoke a feedback loop. Joy causes happiness and physical pleasure. Happiness and physical pleasure increase unification, and unification causes meditative joy. Once set in motion, the loop ensures that as the mind grows unified, the joy and happiness it produces will induce still greater unification. Meditative absorptions, jhana, are flow states that can also help you take advantage of the positive feedback loop between unification, joy, and happiness. That's why the jhanas are so useful in the adept stages. Once some joy and happiness are present, Absorption intensifies the joy and happiness, and a temporary but very strong unification results. When we repeat this often enough, our mind becomes habituated to unification. You may have experienced some mild, brief episodes of meditative joy in stages four through seven. You will have experienced longer, more intense episodes if you did the whole body and pleasure jhana practices in stages six and seven. However, the joy of grades four and five piti in stage eight is something you've likely never experienced before. Energy Currents and Involuntary Movements Before achieving fully developed meditative joy, you'll encounter various energy currents, involuntary movements, and autonomic activity, all of which can be quite uncomfortable. Eventually, the movements and autonomic reactions will stop, 
the energy currents will be pleasant, and you'll experience the meditative joy of grade 5 PT. But until then, the flow of newly available energy, due to increasing unification, is quite turbulent. In the ordinary, untrained, and ununified mind, much of the energy generated by individual subminds gets used up in inner conflicts, many of them unconscious. As an analogy, picture a group of horses, all tethered together, but with each one trying to move in a different direction. Any movement of the group as a whole will be slow. The direction and speed of movement will depend on the strongest horses, and whenever several horses happen, by chance, to start pulling in the same direction. Abrupt changes in direction will also happen frequently and unpredictably. The behavior of the untrained mind is much the same. Attention wavers and scatters constantly vulnerable to being captured by new sensory or mental objects. Unrelated thoughts come up. Many different kinds of emotions, including restlessness, doubt, and boredom, arise out of the unconscious mind, each claiming justification and demanding to be responded to. When the mind begins to unify, it's like more of the horses are heading in the same direction at the same time, so the speed and momentum of the group as a whole that is, the net kinetic energy, increases. The course becomes more consistent, but the movement isn't smooth. In fact, because some animals still resist while others may stumble and be dragged along by the group, it's more violent and erratic than ever. And as long as some keep resisting and try to go in different directions, the turbulence will continue. The available mental energy increases, but until unification is complete, the flow of that energy is turbulent. Turbulent mental energy manifests in various ways. The feeling of energy currents coursing through the body can be tumultuous or even painful, though they can also be mild and pleasant. These energy currents, as well as the involuntary movements and autonomic reactions that often accompany them, were described in detail in the sixth interlude. These currents are the same chi, prana, or inner wind that you experienced in the body scanning and whole body breath practices of stages 5 and 6. As the mind progressively unifies in stage 8, this energy intensifies. But as long as unification is incomplete, the turbulence intensifies as well. By the end of stage 8, you can consistently unify your mind enough for sustained meditative joy to arise, along with the blisses of physical and mental pliancy. Involuntary movements stop, and the flow of energy feels much smoother and more pleasant. However, the meditative joy may be so intense that it becomes enormously distracting. In fact, meditators will sometimes end their meditation early, just so they can go talk to someone about it. To conclude with our analogy, when all the tethered horses pull in the same direction, they form a powerful team that moves smoothly and is easily controlled. So, too, a unified mind displays a smooth, controlled power in the movement of mental energy, and turbulence completely disappears. But not until the end of stage nine will unification be complete enough for that to happen. Until then, you can expect your meditation to be dominated by experiences of excess, uncontrolled energy. Practices to Help Achieve Physical Pliancy and Meditative Joy At some point, you'll experience the manifestations of physical pliancy, such as the absence of ordinary tactile sensations, feelings of weightlessness or floating, and pleasurable sensations throughout the body, grade 4 PT. When this happens, it's time to temporarily abandon the practices described in the section on exercising the newly compliant mind. You're in the home stretch for this stage. Now the most important thing is to completely ignore bodily sensations of any kind. Here are two practices that can help. Finding the still point and realizing the witness. This practice allows us to step outside our reactions to the sensory experiences associated with pacification and the arising of piti. 
This creates enough detachment to let these processes unfold naturally by themselves. Petey's sensations still appear in awareness, but receive no attention at all. Start your meditation by becoming fully aware of the world around you. Explore your immediate environs with attention. Feel it in your body. Listen to the sounds inside and outside the room you're sitting in. Sense all of the activity that's going on. For example, you might hear airplanes flying overhead, traffic noises, birds and dogs, and various human activities. Then let your mind identify and fill in the source of the sounds you hear. Picture in your mind the cars you hear, the airplanes flying through the sky, and the birds sitting in trees. Expand the scope of your attention to include a visualization of the constant ferment of activity going on all over the world, on land, in the waters, and in the sky. Reflect on the earth as it spins on its axis, moving through space at thousands of miles per hour, surrounded by the constant motion of planets and stars and entire galaxies whirling through the void at inconceivable speeds. While keeping this universe of ceaseless movement and change clear in your awareness, shift your attention to your body, sitting in stillness on the cushion. Allow the contrast between the stillness of your body and the activity of the external world to saturate your consciousness. Keep your attention focused on your body while the rest of the world fills your awareness. Over time, you'll naturally become aware of movement and activity in the body, breathing, the beating of your heart, and pulsing in your arteries, and maybe the energy currents and involuntary movements of pity. Visualize all the other activity you know is taking place in your body, the movement of food through your digestive tract, the flow of blood through tissue, urine collecting in the bladder, and glands secreting substances of all kinds. Once you have a clear, strong sense of your body as a hive of activity, shift the focus of your attention to your mind. Let the hum of activity in your body join the rest of the world in peripheral awareness, while attending to the relative peace and quiet of your well-trained mind. Contrast the relative calm and quiet of the mind with all the turmoil, activity, and change in the realm of physical sensations, noting in particular that quality of mental stillness and peace. Allow your attention to dwell on the difference between your mind's inner stillness and the teeming activity in your body and the world. Inevitably, you start to notice that the mind really isn't that quiet after all, except when compared to everything outside of it. At the same time, you'll become aware of an even greater stillness at the core of your moment-to-moment -moment experience. This is called the still point. Find that still point and make its stillness the focus of your attention. Relegate everything else to peripheral awareness, letting things remain or pass away as they will. Enjoy the still point, resting in it as often and for as long as you like. The strange sensations of pacification and the energies of pity will just blend in with everything else in the background of awareness while attention rests unperturbed. Unification will continue. By doing this practice and investigating the still point, it becomes obvious that this is where all observation happens. The still point, in other words, is the metaphorical vantage point from which metacognitive awareness occurs, except that it's now become the seat of metacognitive attention. And the focus of your attention is the subjective experience of looking at the mind and the material world from a totally detached perspective. As you keep observing, you may also discover the so-called witness the subjective experience of a pure, unmoving, and unmoved observer who is unaffected by whatever is observed. A warning is in order here. You will likely feel that you have discovered the true self, the ultimate ground of all experience. In a sense, you have. But it's not at all what you think. The witness state is the ultimate ground of your personal experience. 
but it has arisen in dependence upon the body and the world, and it will disappear with the body. Its real value and significance is that it points toward a much more profound insight, provided you don't make the mistake of clinging to it as a self. Doing so only nourishes the attachment we are all born with to the idea of being a singular, enduring, and separate self. Mistaking the witness state for a true self is what leads some people to claim that consciousness is the true self. To properly use the witness experience, probe more deeply. Go to the still point, the place of the witness, with a question. Who or what is this witness? Who is watching? Who is experiencing? Adamantly refuse to entertain any answers offered by your intellectual, thinking mind. Also, don't be deceived by your emotional mind, which will try to make you believe you've found the answer when you haven't. Just hold on to the question as you experience the witness. If and when insight arises, it will be a profound insight into the truth of no self, and it will be so obvious that you'll wonder why you never realized it before. Don't judge yourself or your practice by whether or not you discover the witness, or whether or not you have insight into no self. These will happen in time. Meanwhile, the still point meditation is a powerful method for achieving the goals of this stage unification, pacification of the senses, and meditative joy. The Luminous Jhanas these are deeper than the whole body or pleasure jhanas and are called luminous because the object of meditation used for entering the first jhana is the illumination phenomenon. This inner light is often called animitta, and the sensations of the breath are abandoned in favor of this luminous nimitta. Because it is mind-generated rather than being a true sensory object, it allows all sensory content to be completely excluded from consciousness. Not everyone experiences the inner illumination phenomenon, so not everyone can practice these jhanas. If you're one of these people, don't worry. Jhana practice isn't essential to mastering stage aid. Also, even deeper jhanas will become available once you've mastered the later stages. The nimitta may begin as a soft, fuzzy, or misty illumination as a glowing disk or sphere, or as star-like, flickering pinpoints of light. If the nimitta is dim at first, it will gradually brighten, the pinpoints will expand, and multiple sparkles will coalesce. Colored lights tend to pale toward white, and the nimitta becomes more radiant, bright, and clear. When it appears, resist the temptation to chase the nimitta, it will usually disappear if you direct attention toward it too soon. To cultivate the nimitta, keep your attention focused on the breath sensations while allowing the illumination to grow and brighten in peripheral awareness. At the same time, don't completely disregard it. Be as fully aware of it as you can without diverting attention toward it. Sometimes it won't appear at all. Just remain patient. Eventually, it will be there all the time. Also, don't try to will it to grow or intensify. That actually prevents the nimitta from developing naturally, making it fade away. The nimitta must develop on its own. As it intensifies, the sensations associated with pacification of the senses fade from peripheral awareness. The sustained subtle dullness can sometimes creep in as you allow the nimitta to develop in the background, so be careful that doesn't happen. Otherwise you can get stuck and your undeveloped nimitta just won't go anywhere. As you'll soon discover, attention occasionally alternates with the nimitta in peripheral awareness. That's all right, because alternating attention lets you know when the nimitta has become stable enough to accept attention. Eventually, you will notice that when your attention shifts to the nimitta, it no longer fades. Once that happens, you can intentionally allow attention to alternate between the nimitta and the breath. Attention will naturally be drawn to the nimitta, 
spending more and more time with it. At some point, the breath and the nimitta will both be receiving the same amount of attention, and the two will seem to merge. When this happens, start working with the nimitta. First, intentionally let it recede into the background, appearing small and distant. Then, bring it in close, so that it completely fills your visual field. Next, try shifting the bright center of the nimitta up or down, or from side to side. When the nimitta is stable enough that you can control it like this, you are ready to completely abandon the physical sensations of the breath and attend exclusively to the nimitta. Not everyone will succeed in moving the nimitta, but it doesn't matter. As long as your efforts don't cause it to fade, it's stable enough to use for entering jhana. Entering First Luminous Jhana Once the nimitta is stable enough to become the object of exclusive attention, you are ready to enter the First Luminous Jhana. Absorbing into this nimitta is not something you do. It's a surrendering that draws the mind into the experience of the moment. Open up to it totally, becoming a completely passive observer. The mind is relaxed but alert, and attention and awareness are sharp and clear. Entering this kind of deep jhana has been compared to submerging yourself in a warm bath. The bliss of physical pliancy floods the body with pleasure, pervading and saturating it everywhere. Meditative joy intensifies as well, and feelings of happiness grow as the bliss of mental pliancy increases. Energy intensifies as the mind fills with joy and happiness. You still feel energy sensations in your body, but they are no longer disturbing or unpleasant. Spontaneous physical movements cease, replaced by a profound stillness. Attention fuses with its object, and awareness takes on an open, spacious quality. The perception of the nimitta in the first jhana is sharper, clearer, and more intense than ever. At first, there may be some subtle unsteadiness in terms of the contents of awareness. Certain objects may intrude. For example, there may be some awareness of actual physical sensations, or of mind-generated bodily sensations due to pacification. But as you stay focused exclusively on the nimitta, these fade, and you're soon fully absorbed in jhana. If you've previously practiced the whole body or pleasure jhanas, you will immediately recognize when you've slipped into the familiar groove. But if you've never experienced jhana before, you may wonder how you will know when you've reached jhana. After all, the jhana factors are all present with access concentration, and if you were to describe the state of your mind in access, it would sound exactly like the classical descriptions of jhana. Just persevere. When you do finally enter jhana, you will no longer have any doubts about it. And best of all, the mind will know how to find its way back to this state again in the future. The jhana may not last long to begin with, especially if this is your first time experiencing jhana. But when you pop out, just go back in. Keep returning to jhana until you can stay in for longer, working up to ten minutes, then half an hour, and eventually an hour or more. When you emerge, you will have a sudden experience of intense sensory awareness. Your mind is highly sensitized to every kind of sensory input. That's why we describe it as popping out. The deeper the jhana and the longer you've been in, the more intense the emergence. Practice entering the jhana at will, sustaining it for a predetermined period and emerging at the intended time. To do this, you must generate a strong intention while in access concentration. People often find it useful to mentally verbalize these intentions. I resolve to enter first jhana and remain for X minutes. Remember, you cannot make these things happen yourself because no doing or deciding happens in jhana, but holding a conscious intention prior to entering the jhana will cause them to happen. When you can stay longer in jhana, you will discover there is a timeless quality to it, 
meaning you have no awareness of how much or little time has passed. To practice remaining in jhana for predetermined periods, you will need to position an easy-to-read clock in front of yourself. Give it a quick glance before entering access, and again on emerging from the jhana. Once you emerge from jhana, review your experience. Compare and contrast the access, jhana, and post-jhanic states. When you emerge from jhana, there will be a very strong imprint of the jhanic state in memory. Compare that recollection with the post jhanic state you're in. It's like putting two transparencies together and holding them up to the light. You can easily see what is different and what is the same. Do the same with your memory of the pre jhanic access state. Then compare the jhana and pre jhanic access states to each other. Notice the similarities and differences between each of these three states, what is present and absent, and the subjective qualities associated with each. The first jhana is characterized by profound calmness, a clear, sharp perception of the nimitta as the object of attention, vitaka and vichara, and awareness of joy, pleasure and happiness, piti sukha. The mind is, of course, in a highly unified state, ikagata. As you get more familiar with the jhana, though, you will realize that the intensity of first jhana often fluctuates. This instability is typical of first jhana. Sometimes you may even be aware of a thought or intention arising in the mind. Whenever this happens, it's because you have very briefly emerged, then immediately re-entered jhana, like a swimming dolphin that barely breaks the surface before diving again. Another first jhana quality you will become aware of over time is a subtle energetic vibration often felt in the body. Eventually you will grow increasingly dissatisfied with how the jhana fluctuates in intensity. This indicates you're ready for second jhana. But don't rush it. Getting Stuck You can get stuck at any point during the process of pacification of the senses and the arising of meditative joy. You'll know because you'll constantly have disruptive and often unpleasant experiences in meditation, with little or no sign of change or improvement. Say, for example, that every time after you sit down and achieve effortlessness, you always experience abrupt, violent, jerking movements, or an unpleasant tingling, itchiness, and hot flashes that just get more disagreeable over time or you experience intensely unpleasant energy sensations and severe pain in your chest or neck, or constantly feel like you're falling over. Maybe you often get dizzy, sweat, or feel nauseated. While a certain amount of this is normal, when it happens consistently and doesn't improve, something is blocking your progress. As we explained in the sixth interlude, it may be the hindrances of aversion and agitation due to worry and remorse. To the degree these hindrances are present, even at a subconscious level, they prevent unification of the mind and normal progress through the grades of piti. The antidote to aversion is deliberately cultivating love, compassion, patience, generosity, and forgiveness toward everyone, including yourself. The antidote to worry and remorse is practicing virtue in every aspect of your life. You can change bad habits and stop doing things that create the causes of worry and remorse. Make amends for things you've already done or failed to do. And if you can't do it directly, do it through acts of kindness and service to those who suffer in the ways you've made others suffer. Seek others' forgiveness. And especially... Forgive yourself. In other words, if you find yourself getting stuck in stage eight, the answer lies outside meditation in how you live the rest of your life. Adept practice depends on everything you do, all day long, every day. There is actually an advantage to working through stage eight in daily practice rather than in deep retreat. You have more opportunities to take the appropriate actions to overcome these hindrances. Thus, Ananda, the purpose and benefit of virtuous behavior is freedom from remorse. 
The purpose and benefit of freedom from remorse is satisfaction. The purpose and benefit of satisfaction is joy, pity. The purpose and benefit of joy is pacification of the body. The purpose and benefit of pacification of the body is pleasure, sukha. The purpose and benefit of pleasure is concentration, samadhi. The purpose and benefit of concentration is knowledge and vision of things as they really are. The purpose and benefit of knowledge and vision of things as they really are is disenchantment and dispassion. The purpose and benefit of disenchantment and dispassion is knowledge and vision of liberation. Kamatiya Sutta Purpose and Benefits of Virtue From the Anguttara Nikaya 10.1.1.1 Conclusion You've mastered stage eight when you achieve physical pliancy and meditative joy almost every time you sit. Experiencing periods of grade five PT once or twice, or even every third or fourth time you sit, is not yet true mastery. Consistency is key. Ordinary sensations have disappeared from awareness. The perception of your body may have changed, feeling light and pleasant, and you have no need or desire to move. The illumination phenomenon, if present, has become an all-pervading light or bright, stable orb. The inner sound is either pleasant or just a meaningless, unobtrusive background noise. You still feel energy flowing through the body, circulating between the base of the spine and the crown of the head, and between the body core and periphery, but it's much smoother and more pleasant. The intensity of joy and feelings of energy may grow so strong that they can't be sustained, or they may make you want to end your meditation early. That's normal. Becoming familiar with meditative joy so this doesn't happen is the work of Stage 9. Stage 9. Mental and Physical Pliancy and Calming the Intensity of Meditative Joy 9. The goal of stage nine is the maturation of meditative joy that produces tranquility and equanimity. As you continue to practice, simply abiding in the state of meditative joy will cause profound tranquility and equanimity to arise. In stages nine and ten, you fully unify the mind, moving from a state of highly excited meditative joy and happiness to one of serene joy and happiness. The resulting shamatha has five qualities of mind, fully stable attention, powerful mindfulness, joy, tranquility, and equanimity. Although meditation experiences in these final stages are quite consistent from one person to the next, they are often described in very different ways, partly because it's hard to put such rare, subtle experiences into familiar terms. The other reason is that people explain their experiences according to the diverse conceptual models provided by the particular traditions they follow. However, as your practice progresses, you will start recognizing the common experiences these various descriptions all point toward. Here we give a general description, using only the conceptual models we've introduced in this book, while avoiding the unique particulars belonging to specific traditions. Practice Goals for Stage 9 You've reached Stage 9 when there's complete pacification of the senses and fully developed meditative joy. This means that almost every time you sit, you can enter a state of mental and physical pliancy, accompanied by the blisses of mental and physical pliancy. This is also called Grade 5, or Pervading PT, which you experience as circulating energy, physical comfort, pleasure, stability, and intense joy. Although you can regularly achieve this grade of piti, each time you do, the growing intensity of the joy and energy of the experience inevitably disrupts it. The goal of stage nine is for meditative joy to mature completely and for piti to subside in intensity. You accomplish this by repeatedly reaching grade 5 PT and sustaining it for as long as you can. Other than that, you just have to stay out of the way while continuing to practice. When you can stay with the PT long enough, 
allowing a unification to proceed and joy to mature, pity eventually gives way to tranquility and equanimity. This is the essence of Stage 9 practice. Pity as an inclusive term We use pity in these final stages as an inclusive term that captures a lot of complexity in a succinct way. It will be helpful to remember everything this umbrella term includes. Full pacification of the senses, along with physical pliancy, and the bliss of physical pliancy, and meditative joy, along with mental pliancy, and the bliss of mental pliancy. Calming PT and Maturing Joy For the intensity of PT to calm, you need to be able to sustain it until the intensity peaks and starts to subside, giving way to tranquility and equanimity. At first, grade 5 PT can't be sustained very long at all, because physical pliancy is so novel, interesting, and enjoyable and the highly energized, excited state of grade 5 PT makes potential distractions, such as altered body perception, illumination, and inner sound, even more potent. Competing intentions to attend to these phenomena repeatedly succeed in disrupting the consensus to attend exclusively to the breath. The excitement can also produce a powerful, restless urge to get up and share your experience with someone it's also common to mistake the intense joy, inner light, and transformed perception of the body for something more exalted. The ebullient satisfaction of meditative joy may make you think, I've arrived. What more could I want? This is it. Remember, joy affects not only how we feel in response to experiences, but also how we perceive and interpret them. Enjoy these positive qualities— but don't be misled by them. To deal with these distractions, urges, and misperceptions, recognize them for what they are, and just let them come, let them be, and let them go. Yes, you'll likely give in a few times at first, but as soon as the euphoria subsides, return to the practice with a firm resolve to ignore whatever arises. On the positive side, these disruptions let you practice regaining pity after you've lost it. An adept meditator at this stage can usually overcome these problems quickly and easily and stay with the pity longer. However, the better you are at ignoring these potential disruptions and the longer you succeed in sustaining grade 5 pity, the more intense the mental energy associated with joy becomes. This is because ignoring them further unifies the mind making even more energy available. In turn, the increased energy makes the joy more buzzy and frenetic until the very intensity of the experience disrupts the PT again. Your greatest challenge in this stage is that the mental energy keeps increasing until you can't even stay focused enough to sustain mental and physical pliancy. The solution is just to be resolute and persevere in your practice. When you falter, re-enter the state of pervasive pity and keep your attention on the breath while ignoring the energy and excitement. It's the same as when you pacified the discriminating mind and the senses. The conscious intention to let these things remain in awareness, combined with the firm resolve to ignore them with attention, allows the mind to unify and transforms how the mind system functions. So, practice at this stage is really quite simple. Achieve pity, sustain it for as long as possible, and start over when you lose it. Eventually you can sustain pity long enough for its intensity to peak and begin subsiding. Subjectively, it seems like you just get used to the intensity of the pity, that it subsides because you've become familiar with it. At a deeper level, it's because the mind system continues to unify. The same energy that once caused disruption now gets channeled into stabilizing the entire mind system. Once that happens, you can usually sustain a state of tranquil pity for the rest of the sit. With continued practice, you won't just get used to the initial energy and excitement, but the peak will grow less intense as well. It eventually becomes more of a bump, easy to traverse, followed by even stronger tranquility. Sometimes, especially in retreats, the bump disappears completely, 
and you slide right into tranquility and equanimity. What subsides first is the bliss of physical pliancy, the deliciously pleasurable physical sensation that pervades the body. It doesn't disappear completely, but it recedes into the background. However, the stable, comfortable, and pain-free condition of physical pliancy doesn't change. Next, the coarseness of the bliss of mental pliancy, its energetic, agitated quality, disappears, replaced by a serene happiness and tranquility. It's a lot like a post-orgasmic state. Physical pleasure has subsided, but a residue remains, and the intensity and excitement have also faded, but the joy and happiness persist. Useful Practices for Calming Piti and Maturing Joy by repeatedly focusing your attention on the breath and ignoring everything else, you can sustain piti, allowing joy to mature as the mind grows unified. However, if you've been practicing the luminous jhanas, you can speed up your progress by regularly moving through the higher luminous jhanas. The second jhana has the same quality of mental excitement and intensity as a completed stage 8 and early stage 9, but with the greater stability of absorption. Moving to the third jhana is just like successfully achieving the goal of stage nine. The intensity and agitation are gone, and there is only a serene pleasure and happiness. The fourth luminous jhana is like stage ten, with only tranquility and equanimity. Therefore, these jhanas can help habituate you to the calm piti of the mature form of joy. Other practices that can help calm piti have the added benefit of being conducive to insight. These include the meditation on dependent arising and finding the still point and realizing the witness. Another extremely powerful practice for calming piti and generating insight is meditating on the mind. Meditating on the Mind Meditating on the mind itself involves bringing attention and awareness together in a completely open state. Essentially, you're fusing attention and awareness. To achieve this, you expand your scope of attention until it includes everything in your field of conscious awareness, both extrospective and introspective. This is similar to how you expanded your scope of attention to include the whole body in stage six, except that you're expanding it to include much, much more than just bodily sensations. And, as with the whole body practice, the amount of conscious power required for attention to encompass so much is enormous. That means much of the excess mental energy made available through unification can get put to immediate use instead of just agitating the mind. Start either from the still point or from an exclusive focus on the breath with strong metacognitive awareness. Expand your scope of attention gradually at first. You're working against the natural tendency for attention to contract around a particular object, so each time you expand the scope a little more, rest for a while in that larger, more open space. Make sure that everything within that scope is perceived with equal clarity before moving ahead. Whether you start with the attention focused on the still point or the breath, awareness should be almost entirely metacognitive. When you expand the scope of attention until it includes everything in awareness, the entire field of conscious awareness is the focus of attention. The object of meditation is the mind itself, and the distinction between attention and awareness disappears. As you know from the practices you did in Stage 8, metacognitive awareness can include extrospective content. In other words, you can be metacognitively aware of external sensory information passing through the mind. Therefore, allow your mind to project both sensations and purely mental objects into consciousness. Hold a clear intention to allow things to come and go in peripheral awareness, but in a slow and gentle way, rather than as a flood. Attention will still try to contract around specific objects, so practice catching that impulse as soon as each new thought or sensation arises, and immediately release attention before it can zoom in.
you will eventually have the sense that attention and awareness have merged and become indistinguishable. The holistic quality of awareness and the analytic precision of attention are both fully present. The mind has become a well-tuned and powerful instrument, capable of simultaneously observing individual objects and their relationship to the entire field of conscious awareness. This is an extremely clear perception that takes place within a vast, open mental space. As you observe the mind with great clarity, you start distinguishing between two fundamental states of consciousness. The first is where the mind is active. Specific sensations and mental objects are being projected into the field of conscious awareness by unconscious sub-minds. The other is a state of comparative rest, where no cognizable objects are present, and the space-like field of conscious awareness lies still and empty. Your objective is to investigate the nature of the mind by comparing the active and resting receptive states. The main purpose of this practice, for this stage, is to generate stable, consistent tranquility and equanimity. Yet it's also extremely effective at producing insight. Indeed, some adepts use it as their primary technique for investigating the mind. The description of the mind in a resting state may sound like the cessation event discussed in the seventh interlude. To be clear, they are not the same. This is not cessation, and consciousness does have content, just not a cognizable object. However, this investigation can give rise to the same insights as the cessation experience. Insight, Emptiness and the Nature of Mind By observing the nature of mind in both its active and passive states, it eventually becomes clear that all objects of consciousness are constructs of the mind. All we've ever known is what the mind itself has produced. The true nature of these mind-made objects of consciousness is simply the nature of mind itself. You may have already grasped this intellectually, but you now experience it directly. True, there may have been some external stimulus that caused your unconscious sub-minds to project a particular object into consciousness, but all we can ever observe is the mental object, a product of the mind itself, not the source of the original stimulus. To put it another way, the thing in itself that stimulated the mind to produce the object can never be observed. The mind creates its own reality, made entirely of cognitive, emotional constructs produced in response to unknown and ultimately unknowable forces acting on the mind through the senses. Furthermore, the perceived appearance of these constructs has far more to do with the nature of the constructing mind than with the actual sources of sensory data. The one thing we can be sure of is that the true nature of that unknown source is quite different from anything the mind projects. This is what is referred to as the emptiness of all phenomena. The objects of consciousness arising and passing away in the mind are like waves rising and disappearing on the ocean surface. Just as the waves have no existence apart from the ocean, arising due to forces acting on the ocean, so, too, with the contents of consciousness and the mind. The ego-self, that familiar notion of who and what we are, is just another one of those empty mental constructs so are the egocentric thoughts, emotions, and intentions that arise in consciousness that reinforce belief in the ego-self. When you realize your ego-self is as empty as any other mental phenomenon, you may be tempted to relocate your sense of personal identity to the mind, or even consciousness itself. However, if you keep practicing this meditation on the mind, you will eventually realize that your perception of the mind at rest is as much a construct as anything else. That is, your subjective experience of watching the mind, and therefore the very idea of the mind as something self-existently real that can be watched, is no different from any other object created by the mind. The mind is as empty as the objects that arise within it. With this further insight, 
it's no longer possible to believe in your mind as the self. The insight experience triggering this last insight is often a cessation event, and, as with the cessation discussed in the seventh interlude, takes the form of a pure consciousness experience, or consciousness without an object. Our subjective experience of time stops. Consciousness has no object apart from this simple fact of consciousness itself. There is no sense of self in this experience, no witness, nothing. In the words of the Buddha, it is gone to suchness, or in the words of Nisargadatta, I am that. The more you engage in this practice, the deeper this insight will go, penetrating bit by bit, ever deeper into the most hidden recesses of your psyche. For this particular insight experience to occur, a specific constellation of causes and conditions must be present. In addition to stable attention, mindfulness, and joy, you require tranquility, equanimity, investigation, and diligence. The more complete and lasting your shamatha, the more strongly developed these factors are, and the more chance there is for insight to arise. Yet keep in mind, attachment to insight can itself be an impediment. It's far better to surrender all hopes and expectations. Just practice from a place of trust, for the sake of whatever your meditation may bring. These insights will come in their own time. Awakening is an accident, but meditating on the mind is a practice that will make you accident-prone. It's especially important not to be deceived by mere intellectual understanding. You may think you got it just by listening to this description. However, Many philosophers and scientists have understood this truth intellectually, but it hasn't transformed them. We haven't gotten it until this insight completely transforms the way we perceive the world, especially during challenging times, like when we're in an argument with our boss or partner, in a traffic jam, or when our house burns down. The Arising of Tranquility and Equanimity when the intensity of piti starts to subside, the mind's energy level doesn't drop. The mind actually has more energy than before, but it's being channeled differently, so the joy is accompanied by a sense of tranquility. The very energy that initially made your meditation so unstable is, in fact, the source of your increased stability. Flowing water provides a helpful analogy. Compare the wide, tranquil, glass-like smoothness of the Ganges to a narrow, roaring mountain stream. Even though the total kinetic energy of the Ganges is far greater, the narrow stream appears more powerful. This is because the constricted, cluttered stream bed produces a disordered, turbulent flow, whereas the Ganges has an orderly, smooth flow through a broad and unobstructed channel. The greater energy of the Ganges has carved a larger channel for itself, clearing obstructions and making the flow of energy far more organized. Before Shamatha, the mind is like a wild but powerful mountain stream. There's a state of joy, but the accompanying energy is exuberant and turbulent, which is what gave the bliss of mental pliancy its coarseness. But just as with a river, the turbulent energy of piti eventually opens the inner channels, and the energy flow becomes tranquil and serene. Serenity and tranquility are quite blissful, and as they increase, so does the bliss. When the excitement of piti subsides, and there's enough tranquility, equanimity naturally arises. Equanimity is non-reactivity to pleasure and pain. Joyful tranquility produces equanimity simply because the pleasure and happiness generated within are so fulfilling that you already feel completely satisfied. Likewise, remember that joy not only causes a positive shift in affect, but also changes our perceptions in ways that maximize satisfaction. For both these reasons, we become much less reactive to pleasant and unpleasant events, since there's no need to pursue or avoid anything. In other words, equanimity arises because you're already happy and satisfied. 
Acting at a deeper level, equanimity also eliminates the tendency to see ourselves and our needs as more important than those of others. Conclusion You have mastered Stage 9 when you consistently achieve stable attention and mindfulness, accompanied by joy and tranquility. Equanimity is also present and grows much stronger in the tenth and final stage. Together, these five factors constitute the state of shamatha. However, when you get off the cushion, these qualities all rapidly fade. You're ready now to begin the work of stage ten. Experiencing the mental formations of meditative joy and pleasure, happiness, while breathing in, he trains himself. Experiencing the mental formations of meditative joy and pleasure, happiness, while breathing out, he trains himself. Calming these mental formations while breathing in, he trains himself. Calming these mental formations while breathing out, he trains himself. Anapanasati Sutta Stage 10. Tranquility and Equanimity 10. The goal of Stage 10 is for the qualities of shamatha to persist after you rise from the cushion. Just continuing to practice regularly will cause the profound joy and happiness, tranquility and equanimity you experience in meditation to persist between meditation sessions. Practice Goals for Stage 10 All five factors of shamatha are present in Stage 10. Each time you sit, you quickly enter a state where attention is stable, mindfulness is powerful, and the unified mind rests in a state of joy, accompanied by tranquility and equanimity. However, these quickly fade when you rise from the cushion. Your goal for this stage is is to reach a point where shamatha persists between sittings, permeating your everyday life. This is the one real change left in the perfection of shamatha. Then shamatha becomes the normal condition for the adept mediator. The distinction between meditation and non-meditation largely disappears. As with the goals for the other adept stages, all you have to do is keep practicing and shamatha will last longer and longer each time after you get up. You don't need to do anything new. However, you can practice mindfulness in daily life in a way that prevents shamatha from eroding as quickly. The Role of Equanimity When you rise from meditation, you soon become engaged with external stimuli that the mind must respond to. Many of the mind's responses involve habitual reactions in the form of desire and aversion. Equanimity means non-reactivity, so as long as equanimity is strong enough, these mental habits will have little effect. However, attention must move in response to events in daily life much faster than it does in response to intentions in meditation. Furthermore, the variety of situations needing to be dealt with is far greater. Before long, equanimity is overwhelmed, and reactivity in the form of desire and aversion erodes unification of the mind. Since unification is the pillar on which shamatha rests, we soon find ourselves back in a normal state of mind. You may not have analyzed the process by which this occurs, but by the time you reach stage ten, you'll have experienced this many times. Equanimity is what ultimately prolongs shamatha outside meditation. Equanimity will grow stronger through stage ten, and as it does, shamatha will last longer after your sits end. Clearly, the more equanimity you have in meditation, the more you will have afterward as well. But you can also support and sustain that post-meditation equanimity by practicing mindfulness in daily life. Sustaining Shamatha with Joy, Equanimity, and Mindfulness Although Shamatha tends to fade after we get up, a state of joy tends to linger. Joy produces pleasure and happiness, and this positive effect, coming entirely from within, makes us less likely to react to external events with desire or aversion. That is, post-meditative joy 
can also help sustain equanimity. It goes in the other direction, too. Equanimity keeps desire and aversion from eroding unification of mind, which in turn supports and sustains the continuation of joy in everyday life. The two reinforce each other. Therefore, the key to extending shamatha in everyday life is to support joy and reinforce equanimity through mindfulness. Practicing mindfulness off the cushion means being aware whenever desire or aversion arise. When that happens, recognize what's going on. Some unconscious subminds are in conflict with what is, craving for something to be different. Don't resist, reject, or suppress the craving. Instead, ignore it. Then intentionally direct your attention to that inner pleasure and happiness that has nothing to do with what's occurring externally. Likewise, purposely intend to notice the positive aspect of whatever you perceive. As long as all the other sub-minds don't react to the event or to the feelings of desire and aversion arising in reaction to it, then the conflicted sub-minds will come back into line. When we mindfully observe and accept both the situation and our mind's reaction to it, equanimously and without judgment, then the mind will remain unified. As equanimity grows stronger in meditation, the mind outside of meditation grows less prone to grasping, and we feel less compelled to pursue pleasant experiences. You'll also enjoy pleasant experiences more fully, because you're no longer attached to them hoping they continue. Similarly, you'll be less and less repelled by unpleasant experiences, facing them with growing equanimity. Practice sustaining joy and equanimity by remaining mindful until some vestige of shamatha persists when you next sit down to meditate. By the time you settle on the cushion, the body will already be still and comfortable, and physical pliancy will soon follow. Since joy, tranquility, and equanimity have not yet fully faded, they quickly return to full strength. Practices for Stage 10 Stage 10 is ideal for doing any type of insight practice. You can do close following, the meditation on arising and passing away, choiceless attention, the meditation on dependent arising, realizing the witness, or anything else. Your mind is also in a perfect state to practice the luminous jhanas as well. Through these practices, insight accumulates and matures, and the experience of awakening quickly follows. Conclusion You have mastered stage ten and achieved the fourth and final milestone when shamatha typically persists from one regular meditation session to the next. Strong desires are noticeably weaker, Negative mental reactions rarely occur, and anger and ill will virtually disappear. Others may find you generally happy and easily pleased, relaxed, agreeable, unaggressive, and peaceful. You will be relatively immune to disturbing events, and physical pain won't particularly bother you. On Mastering Stage 10, the mind is described as unsurpassable. It's an ideal instrument for achieving and deepening profound insight into the true nature of reality and a liberation that is not subject to passing away. The following sequence from the Buddha describes the process by which mastery is achieved. Experiencing the mind while breathing in, he trains himself. Experiencing the mind while breathing out, he trains himself. Making the mind tranquil and fresh while breathing in, he trains himself, making the mind tranquil and fresh while breathing out, he trains himself. Concentrating the mind while breathing in, he trains himself. Concentrating the mind while breathing out, he trains himself. Releasing the mind while breathing in, he trains himself. Releasing the mind while breathing out, he trains himself. Anapanasati Sutta Final Thoughts the goal beyond stage ten is to use the power of shamatha for the continued awakening of insight and to progress to the highest level of complete awakening. The practice in this book is shamatha vipassana, 
but we have focused mostly on the stages of shamatha. The reason was purely practical, to prepare the mind as quickly as possible for the ultimate goal of insight and awakening. With every stage of shamatha you pass through, the possibility of insight grows more likely and increases quite dramatically with each stage from seven on. Many of the techniques described in the later stages are intended to generate insight experiences. Indeed, few meditators master stage ten without having significant insight. Many will have reached at least the first level of awakening. Much more could be said about insight and awakening than can fit into this book, so it must wait for another time. While unlikely, it's possible for someone to master shamatha without achieving insight or awakening. Therefore, it's worth discussing why this might happen, as well as some of the limitations of shamatha, to help protect you from this potential problem. Shamatha and Vipassana The Limitations of Shamatha Persistent shamatha between meditation sessions is a truly wonderful accomplishment, and something to celebrate. Yet never lose sight of the fact that shamatha and vipassana must work together. They are like two wings of a bird. You need both to arrive at your ultimate destination. Too often, however, practitioners forget this relationship and emphasize either shamatha or vipassana. For listeners of this book, the danger is placing all the emphasis on shamatha, seeing this super-refined state of mind as the goal, rather than the ideal state for achieving insight and full awakening. Always remember that even though shamatha is extraordinary, it's still a conditioned mental state. When those causes and conditions cease, shamatha dissolves. Even though shamatha persists for longer after stage ten, it still starts fading gradually but continuously, from the moment you get off the cushion. Life events chip away at this refined state of consciousness, and unconscious sub-minds diverge from consensus, creating inner conflict. Other sub-minds in turn react with aversion, and unification starts unraveling. When enough of your buttons get pushed at once, shamatha will fail. Even if you just spent three hours in deep jhana, if something significant enough happens, shamatha disappears altogether. In an ideal environment, we would always be able to meditate again and return to a state of high unification before shamatha fades. We might succeed in avoiding the kind of events that disunify the mind for a long time, perhaps remaining in a continuous state of shamatha for months. But very few listeners of this book are likely to find themselves in such ideal conditions. Even those so fortunate can never be sure how long those conditions will last, and everyone eventually finds him or herself unable to sustain a regular practice due to sickness, old age, or failing mental faculties. That's why shamatha isn't the final goal of the spiritual path. Instead, Consider it a rare and precious opportunity to achieve the true goal, insight and awakening. The unsurpassable mind of shamatha gives you immediate access to the deepest form of jhana, to every kind of insight practice, and allows you to practice mindfulness in daily life with incomparable effectiveness. In other words, it creates the ideal conditions for liberating insight into the true nature of reality and an awakening that isn't subject to passing away. The unification of mind in shamatha is temporary and conditioned. However, the unification around insight is far more profound, and it's permanent. When temporary unification around a shared intention fades, each sub-mind operates as a separate entity, constrained by and at the mercy of the mind system as a whole. Therefore, individual sub-minds strive to preserve their autonomy and, as much as possible, direct the resources of the mind system toward their individual goals. Yet after insight, the various sub-minds become unified around a shared insight into impermanence, emptiness, suffering, no-self, and interconnectedness. 
From this flow a corresponding set of shared values, harmlessness, compassion, and loving-kindness. Now each sub-mind operates as an independent part of a much greater whole, working for the good of that whole. This allows each sub-mind to do its job effectively, without running into fundamental conflicts with other sub-minds. When enough of the mind system has undergone this transformation, we are able to function as an individual person while simultaneously perceiving ourselves as part of an indivisible and inconceivably greater whole. T.S. Eliot beautifully described the nature of this transformation. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. T.S. Eliot, Four Quartets, Little Gidding The illusion of separate selfhood, with all its attendant suffering, is gone. We can be fully present as persons, here and now, realizing that this personhood is just an ever-changing, selfless construct, arbitrarily imposed on an interconnected whole. Here is merely another construct imposed on infinite space, and now is a similar construct imposed on eternity. This concludes The Mind Illuminated by Chula Dasa, John Yates, Ph.D., and Matthew Immergut, Ph.D., with Jeremy Graves. Narrated by Sean Renette. Copyright 2015 by John Charles Yates. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program.